Yeah, I'm just gonna fire up on FC2, I guess. Okay. Cool. Mine never crashes, but then when yours does, it kind of makes yeah. the whole thing pointless. Okay, Audacity's open. You want to start recording that first? Yeah, just up. one second. Let me just—I'm just adjusting my audio. Do you want to say something real? Just say something really quickly. Uh, something really quickly. Okay, you need—I need to turn you down a little bit. You say something again. Something again. Okay, let me just test my own voice. That should be. Just one more time for me, real quick. Something again, real quick. Do you aim for a certain audio threshold, like? Like when you mix it, I, I know so little about audio mixing that it's kind of. I try tough. to keep it so that my voice on OBS is close to the line between yellow and red. Okay. That makes sense. Can you say something again? Something again. Okay. Don't talk louder than that. It will be beautiful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go. Oh, yeah. Let's do. Let's try the. Okay. I've got two. Let's close one audacity. Yes. So like three, two, one, clap and go on clap, or you can't click on clap. Um, let's just go three, two, one. Let's just go three, two, one, go. It should be, it should be close enough, and then yeah. maybe we can do a clap sync or something. Okay. Okay. Three, two, one, go. You start recording. Yep. Okay. Let's do a clap. Three, two, one, clap. Let's do one more. Three, two, one. Okay. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> um, okay, let's start streaming. Are you recording this too on your end? Just as a, yeah. as a redundancy? Okay, perfect. Uh, stream is starting. Let me just double check everything. Okay, stream is starting now. All right, let me just share this real quick and we can... All right, we're live, or we should be. I need to yeah, remember to mute your stream before this starts. I mean, I, I have a lot of practice muting your stuff, but... <laughs> wow. Yeah, I that's need to remember hurtful. to mute your or stream anything. before this starts. I mean, I, I have a lot of... Okay, just copy the link. I'll just tweet it out, and we can get started. Hello, Andrew. You are the first viewer. Um... My discussion of Heir to the Empire with Corey is... Had now. to think about that for a second? No, I was just trying to tag you. All right. Oh, I screwed it up. Well, you also ruined our chance to have a, a nice pre-stream joke again, so... I know. I, I think that's really what most people anything, listen though. for. What's that? I think that's what most people listen for. Just like whatever discussion of whatever nasty stuff it is. The first 15 seconds of the stream and then... Just gold. Yeah. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I see lots of people here. That's good. Everyone, make sure to drop a like on the stream. Uh, for those who don't know, because I am seeing a lot of new faces, this is, a dis this is basically our uh, podcast. We record it live first on YouTube, and then we... Uh, we put it up on our normal host. You can find links to everything down in the description. What episode is this, Corey? I think this is episode 12. Yeah, episode 12, I think. So was um, that the podcast intro right there that you no, just did? No, no, no. I'm just giving a brief intro because I see a lot of new faces in the chat. So, yeah, not the podcast intro. Uh, let me just open it up and I'll be good to go. All right. Anything you need to do before we start, Corey? No. Okay. Let me just move my windows around. <clears throat> uh, where'd that go? Hold on, I just lost the notes. I'm a I'm a mess. And apparently, mess. like this is this is so unprofessional. All right. <clears throat> hey guys, this is Justin, joined as always by my co-host Corey. Welcome to another episode of Tab Calf Transmissions, and this is the one that I think a lot of you have been waiting for. Part one of the. Uh, the jewel of the Star Wars EU, the Thrawn trilogy. Corey, you said you thought this was episode 12? I think it's episode 12. It might be 13. I'm not sure. Uh, regardless, this is an exciting one. This is kind of what we've been building up to. Um, and for those who don't know, because I suspect we'll probably get some new viewers or some new listeners for this one. Uh, we've been covering the Star Wars Expanded Universe basically on this podcast, starting immediately after the Battle of Endor um, with the Truce of Pakura. 
And now we're, what, five years after with uh, Heir to the Empire, book one yeah. of the Thrawn trilogy? We're five years after Endor, about nine after Yavin, eight or nine. Mm. And uh, yeah, this is this is really where it peaks. This is... <laughs> so if you're going to listen to this episode, you can listen to the next two probably and then just unsubscribe. Yeah, we're like... We're going to be going for years and years after this and <laughs> always looking back to this as our we're going to be basically the people who are like late 40s, 50s wearing their like high school varsity jackets. Yeah. That's that's tap calf transmissions after this episode. It's like instead of like, oh, I swear I could have thrown that football over the mountain and be like, oh, <laughs> I s- remember when Thrawn was attacking Bimisari. Those were the days <laughs> or not Bimisari, Bitfash. He attacked uh, a lot of places. So. Yeah, well, I guess the no Greek kind of attack of Emissary. Yeah. But, um, if it has an, uh, a Wikipedia article saying it's a battle, then we got to count it. I'm not <laughs> sure if that actually does, but I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, it's probably like the skirmish. I bet you it's skirmish. Skirmish on Bimisari. That would be my guess. I haven't looked, but that would be my guess. So yeah, we're, um, we're both really excited to get into this <laughs> book, but at the start of the last few episodes, we've talked a little bit about other Star Wars news for a couple of minutes before getting into the book. And mm-hmm. do we want to... Yeah, quickly no, let, mention let's, Mandalorian let's and Fallen Order, or yeah, I mean, I I also want to talk about my my tracing thing because that's kind of been my oh personal. yeah yeah yeah, but uh, how you yeah, were hired by Marvel to trace a bunch of ship art, and now you're trying to expose it, <laughs> basically. Uh, no, but let, let's talk about the nice things first because I think both did we get to one episode of the Mandalorian on last last time? Was it after the pilot? Uh, I think we did it the night before the Mandalorian started. Oh right, because it would have been Thursday. Yeah. Oh man, that show has been so good. Like, like it's been episodes one and two have both blown me away. Like, mm-hmm. I think the Mandalorian is like my favorite Star Wars thing that you can watch, not including books, because uh, you don't watch books. But it's, it's de- I think it's my favorite thing. Sent besides maybe Revenge of the Sith since the original trilogy. I'm really digging it. I actually think the like the TV or epi- I guess it's not really TV. It's streaming, but. Uh, yeah. That kind of format works really well with Star Wars because you get uh, the main plots, obviously, but you also have a lot more room to expand on the broader details of the universe, especially with how they're doing it, where we're getting like, I was really afraid that we'd have a situation where it's like you get uh, a couple aliens thrown around here and there mm-hmm. because it's just so much cheaper. And I'd, I'd understand why they were doing it. it would be disappointing, but I'd understand yeah. because just the the hassle of getting everyone into costumes, the budget involved in that. But they've been yeah. really good about stuff like that as well. So I'm really excited for what the series is going to be like going forward. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of that too. Like even in the last episode, it was like those little frog or not frogs. They were those like- are called Jawas. You, <laughs> you're the <laughs> okay, worst Star Wars some- fan ever. Listen, stop. No, those little lizards that like they follow them like when they walk down the uh, they're like walking through the cave or whatever, or not a cave through like the canyon. Yeah, and, like they're just there for a second. Um, I thought that was pretty like then those aren't going to reappear because yeah, that, that's the thing that you that, like I certainly worried about, too. Um, if it's going to be a TV show, like how much money are they going to spend on like little scenes or little costumes that will appear once then never again, mm-hmm. you know, like. Part of the reason why I love Star Wars so much is like because it feels like a very it almost feels like a living world. Certainly the original trilogy does. Um, you like look at the cantina and all the aliens are like fully fleshed out and stuff. So I was kind of a bit worried yeah. that. Um, and we, we should probably here. avoid going into any like spoilery stuff on the podcast as well. Before yeah. we we haven't said anything yet, but just to yeah. reassure everyone there. Mm-hmm. But. Um. Yeah, Fallen Order 2. Uh, what, what have you thought of that game? I think we mentioned that a bit last time. I can't remember, but it's a fun game. I haven't beaten it yet, but I've been really enjoying it. Yeah, we mentioned it a bit, but it was also not out. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I've never played a like a, a Souls-like game, I guess. So mm-hmm. it's all fairly new mechanics to me. It took me a while to get used to the combat, but once I did, uh, like I always enjoyed the exploration part of the game, but the more that I've... Uh, the more that I've played and gotten used to the combat, the more I've liked that as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Seems to have a solid story. I'm only a, a couple hours in. I'm not super far in the game yet. But Right. Yeah, I was, I was watching some of your stream. Um, I think you kind of ended. Yeah, like it's 
it's a it's a pretty long game, and I mean it's it's hard, and there's a lot of backtracking, so that kind of stretches out it out a bit as well. Um, I've been really disappointed of how um how people have been like spoiling things on YouTube though. Like if if you are on there like like and you watch a Fallen Order video, you, you get recommended these things that have like final boss fight in the picture. Like I won't say who it is, but or what yeah. it is, or whatever you know. Like because there's various fights. It's just like. Well, there's kind of the same thing with The Mandalorian, where there's a lot of people who won't even have access to it yeah. legally for like six so months March, or something. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there's just pictures of certain things all over the internet, mm-hmm. and even that from was official weird channels too. Which, it, yeah, it's like weird. That, that was a weird choice. It, another thing, kind of weird about The Mandalorian is like, I really don't like the air, like the airtime they chose, like. Like um, it, it it first is posted at like five in the morning or whatever, at least my time. Um, so it's like people who are staying up early or who are who are getting up early or staying up really late can watch it, but like the vast majority of people cannot. Then those spoilers are just out for everywhere. Yeah, out for everyone. Um, and yeah, not a big fan of that. Hopefully, like I'd much prefer if they just moved it to Thursday night. Thursday night prime time. Yeah, primetime Thursday night. Have it release at like, and plus that way you can get like hype for it too, like people getting excited, um, you know, like watch parties and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Like a big a big part of like a fandom is getting ready and watching that stuff. So it would be nice. But Yeah, so I think uh, both of our takeaways so far has been new stuff good. Yeah, it's it's been a, a nice, like not very controversial couple of weeks, which we haven't got a lot <laughs> recently, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that'll probably change. I don't. I don't know. I try to be optimistic, but yeah, there are certain. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've also been. And I mentioned this earlier. I've been my the last couple of weeks. I've been doing this project basically with a few people where we're tracking down all the instances of tracing in Marvel fan art. And it started with when somebody, I mean, a lot of people who watch this might um, be familiar because they're subscribed to the channel, but um, it started off with someone sent me a picture from the Star Wars Allegiance comic line and the ships in it, in the comic itself, were traced from um, models made by somebody who basically sells 3D prints of, uh, of for tabletop games of ships. And you look at the image in the comic and they traced everything, including like the little, uh, I don't know what, pegs, I guess, that the models stand yeah, on. Yeah, like the little support inserts. Yeah, yeah not good. Um, and that kind of like started off a big thing. And I reread through all of, um, I reread through all of the Allegiance the Four comic arc and I found out that every single capital ship and almost every ship, I, I just couldn't find references for um some of the like like there's a random fighter which isn't even named for example i couldn't find references to some of those but every single one was traced from fan art and like every day it seems like it gets deeper um like in my original video i pointed to the marvel uh or sorry the mainline run of star wars they had the uh the mon Cala arc uh the mutiny on mon Cala arc where there's a mm-hmm. bunch of new mon calamari capital ship designs have you have you read that one no no uh, but basically it has like a bunch of really weird Mon Cal ships. Like it's just like a Mon Cal cruiser with like wings coming out of it in random places. It's kind of cool because it gives uh, more than lip service to the fact that each ship is supposed to be, um, supposed to be individualized and whatnot. Uh, but just now before the podcast started, someone sent me the models that those were traced from. So it's like, it's, it's unreal. Like it's, it's way more, um, way more common than I think people realize. Like we've started a we've started like a a, a list um, like a a spreadsheet and I think we're near like a, a hundred instances already. Um, one this is the last thing I'll say on it because I know people want to get onto the main discussion, but one line I forget I forget which one it is now used twelve different fan ships just in one comic series or I think it was like one four four book arc so it's it's pretty wild and hopefully. It's going to be my my passion project for a while, I think. Yeah, and I've seen some pretty like bad take defenses of it, like, "Oh, this is just how comics works." Like, 
there may be certain elements of like tracing for scene composition of mm -hmm. like official references they're given, but this is literally mm -hmm. just these comics couldn't be made if there wasn't such a large store of fan art. Exactly. And like if you look at literally any other comic series, you wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. Or exactly. not literally any, but ninety nine mm -hmm. percent of Most any other of them, ones. Yeah. Yeah. Even with uh like other Marvel comic series. So like the main superhero yeah. ones, there may be fan art of there, but it's not, not like to the ship degree. where they just pose it however they want. They have to yeah. like it, if it's just like clearly someone's group fan art of the Avengers in every panel, exactly. that would be more People, akin to what's happening here. You, you've got something coming up about this on the weekend too, don't you? Are you still planning a video? Yeah. So I, uh, I kind of want to just signal boost what you've been doing as much as possible, which on my cozy channel is a little bit more difficult, but uh, there's some stuff as someone who like actually makes yeah, that yeah. kind of fan content that I, I do want to touch on. And mm -hmm. I've also been talking to Valerie, our concept artist for Thrawn's Revenge, uh, mm -hmm. who I believe is in the chat right now and who basically went to school for uh, more of the industry side of that. Uh, so, or for stuff within that actual industry and trying to get what her take is on yep. uh, a lot of what's been said on that, a lot of the actual practices and how it's supposed to go. Uh, so... It'd be That's interesting be to get to talk like, to like Evil Jedi or someone too, like, or Fractal Sponge, because um, it's just like, it's got to the point where like, I'm actually like, it's every time I look at a piece of Star Wars art now, I just like see who actually like, made this. Right. Because like, for example, they released a new, um, tra a new poster for the Rise of Skywalker and the poster has Imperial 2 Star Destroyers on it, despite the fact that, um that the movie, everything we've seen so far, they're Imperial ones. Yeah, um, and this is something that, uh, especially with Fractal Sponge's stuff, isn't anywhere near new. Like the, I think it's the no, old no. Tor promo materials yeah. where uh, got they Star use, Destroyer. yeah, they have like one of his like Empire era Star Destroyers sitting in mm -hmm. as, uh, I think it's supposed to be a hero in that, or a heroer in that picture. And Oh, in the picture. There's also the Force Unleashed. Yeah, his Star a, a Destroyer. Where his Star Destroyer in it. And there's game, there's like, I've, I've talked to him a couple times about it, and it's just like, it's almost his work, it's hard with him though, his work is so good that it's almost, like, his his modern Star Destroyer models, like, his up-to-date ones, have like, they're almost impossible to tell from like an official model. If you can tell, it's usually because they're better. Um, so it's like, it's kind of tip difficult to tell uh, whether or not, like, what's going on. I think but, even the Empire at War box actually had one of his. I think it might have been his Star Destroyer on the cover. Oh, that's crazy. But um, yeah. But like for the Essential Guide to Warfare, they were good enough to pay for his art, um, like his renders and. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's clearly um, a lot of uh, a lot of places in Star Wars where it happens, but it also seems like it's a bunch of individual decisions. It definitely needs more oversight mm -hmm, from definitely. Uh, Marvel in this case and uh, any other individual production company or uh, series production, but it it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I, I, like whether anything's going to happen or not, I don't know, but I think we need someone like with a much larger audience than myself to signal boost it maybe, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. Shall we move on to the actual uh, to the actual yeah, so haters of it books <laughs> book books book books okay books so do you want to give a brief because I know you're I think you're a little bit more familiar with because you told me something I didn't know and I'll, I'll let you explain but you're probably a bit more familiar with some of the out of universe stuff that happened with uh, the Thrawn trilogy suit so do you want to kind of set the set the scene sort of for what the universe was like before this book came out um yeah so like i'm only universe in particular mm, the what i'm gonna mention here i'm only roughly familiar with it like i don't know a lot of details uh but so the Thrawn trilogy is often seen as like the thing that kind of kick-started new interest in star wars uh mm -hmm. it's kind of the the legends book series that people kind of point to that set a lot of the tone uh i'm just gonna okay so in 1991 is when it released and uh, there was actually, there was a lot less coordination between, uh, different elements of Star Wars. There was less of an idea that it, 
when you were making this expanded universe content that it was going to be part of one main story or one mm-hmm. continuous story. That was really uh, like there were still elements of that. But like if you look at what happens in the Marvel comics and how that ties into the Dark Horse comics yeah. and the uh, the Bantam books, there are it's connections. Like the Star Trek expanded universe. Kind yeah. Of there's less of there's less through lines. There's a lot more places where there were just uh, open contradictions. And that was that wasn't really seen as a huge problem. Uh, each mm. group kind of had their own idea of what the continuity was. And they tried not to step on each other's tone, toes too much, but there was also some direct competition between them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and attempts where they were like actively trying to screw each other over in some <laughs> cases, uh, especially yeah. between Bantam and Dark Horse. Uh, so Dark Horse being most famous for the uh, the Dark Empire series. And actually when Timothy Zahn was, up, Timothy Zahn was approached to do uh, or had his idea for the Thrawn trilogy picked up, it was supposed to be set after Dark Empire. Which were and, being produced at like the same time. Yeah. So the idea was that they were asking him to incorporate some of the things that happened in Dark Empire into his plot. But he was basically saying, no, I will not do that. It was basically uh, kind of like a, yeah, it, like, excuse my crass language. It, it almost, when you read what happened, it almost seems like a bit of a dick measuring contest. Yeah. Like and, between Tom Vike and Timothy Zahn. Yeah, and and this isn't something that was unique to him. Uh, so no. we both have, a, I think, a very high opinion of Timothy Zahn, so we're not saying that in like no, no, as a way not. to like uh, shit on him or something. And especially, like, the idea of these broader universe canons, uh, collaborative canons like that, is at that time, like early 90s, there was a lot less of that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, people like the idea of, I think, Star Wars, like the Star Wars EU, especially like probably the, the Legends Expanded Universe is almost like a unique, probably at least the time it came out, is almost a unique thing in that, like, the degree to, like, the inter- like connectiveness, interconnectivity. Like, if you look at the Star Trek Expanded Universe, I know very little about it, but I know that it's essentially, like, does its own thing. There's, there must be hundreds of Star Trek books. Um, and so I, th- I think if you think of what an Expanded Universe is now, you're probably, like taking in like the current status of what expanded universes are like because of how star wars sort of changed to things yeah the and even within star wars like i mentioned that delray was kind of where that turned around when they picked it up and Mm -hmm. like the njo new jedi order so he's on bong war when that started that was like their first attempt to have something with a lot of uh, major changes for characters, big impacts, big continuity yeah. changes. Because a lot of the Bantam books, there are a lot that are really good. There are a lot that are uh, less good. Mm-hmm. But one of the overarching themes within them is that uh, by the time a series ends, very little has changed from the start. Totally. Uh, so even with the Thrawn trilogy, one of the things we'll see is that, like, yeah, it starts off, uh, the New Republic is setting up, There'll be more set up by the end of it. Same thing with uh, with X Wing, but mm-hmm. fundamentally, there's not much that's gone on with the, with the characters. They weren't, they didn't uh, have any major and shifts in what they were doing. Compared to some one. other books, a lot happens in this, mm-hmm. like the birth of the twins, for example. Um, that's kind of the twins is kind of an interesting one actually, because from what I understand, I think I tweeted, I think I talked to Pablo about this on Twitter. Well. He responded to some of my questions. It's not like we had some sort of candlelight <laughs> dinner or anything. But so the twins is an interesting one because I'm fairly certain because that was like a thing in the in the first issues of Dark Empire. There's no kids um, named besides I think Leia is pregnant with um, Anakin. with Anakin. Mm-hmm. But then later, because as, as most of you probably know, or as I'm sure you'll understand, the Dark Empire was much less popular than the Thrawn trilogy, so it ended up being mostly that um, Dark Empire had to sort of incorporate elements. It had to work with the Thrawn trilogy, and it doesn't. And Timothy Zahn didn't have to sacrifice really anything of his vision. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, I mean, Dark Empire doesn't sacrifice that much. Uh, the Dark Empire source book does a lot of like the leg work on making the two work together, and does actually yeah. a, a, a really good job. Um, but maybe maybe there um, someone said it's mentioned in the first issue. But re- regardless, um... well, that's something that uh, kind of the the tier system that Legends had that was introduced uh, mm-hmm. a, at the end of the '90s, early 2000s. 
where it was like the movies are the top canon. Uh, then you have books, then yeah. games, comics, whatever. And then uh, with stuff like Marvel Comics, it was specifically said that the other authors, people could pull whatever they wanted to use from them for future materials. Yeah. But if they overwrote or disregarded it, then that was fine. Their stuff would take precedence. And then when uh, uh, when the Clone Wars cartoon came out, uh, T canon was added just below movie canon because George yep. Lucas was directly involved in them. Yep. Um, which yeah. is why it's I, it's super frustrating, like making Fall of the Republic our Clone Wars mod, uh, mm-hmm. which we're going to be streaming after this uh, plug. Uh, that that gets labeled as like, oh, that's Disney canon only. But it's like that, if there's one thing that's not the movies that George Lucas had a he- the heaviest involvement in, it was the Clone Wars cartoon. Right. So. It's... Yeah, and like, if like people have pointed this out, but George Lucas, you know, he told what twelve hours of stories or whatever um, with his six movies, but the Clone Wars is, you know, like he put much more t- like of his actual like that like that's so much content that comes from his brain. So like, definitely don't like don't sleep on the Clone Wars, especially for like fundamental things about how Star Wars works and whatnot. Yeah, like, I. it's especially frustrating when I see, like, oh, George Lucas should have been allowed to do whatever he wanted for the sequel trilogy, but also, screw the Clone Wars, because yeah. that's not... That, like, if, if you wanted Legends to continue, you did not want George Lucas <laughs> yeah, making more movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, like, so... Because the characters are, what, 30 years older now, so... We've joked about this before, so I guess we would have been getting Swarmort. episode seven. Swarmort. <laughs> the unseen queen. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's basically just starship troopers, right? Yeah, basically. With said they they get a bit cozier with the bugs. There's less bug. Well, I wouldn't say there's less bug holes. They shove less nukes in bug holes. Um, <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> easy there. But, <laughs> but yeah, like there is, there's really. And I kind of want to talk about this later, but there is no real like reality where there's a Thrawn trilogy episode seven. I don't think that would be good. Like I don't I think, think it'd be good either. I think they're an amazing book series, but yeah, they're they're a good book series, but translating them into film, it would not have gone well. No, uh, this book is probably the best example of why I think. Yeah, and can you imagine like a. We're going to spoil Last Command and Dark Force Rising, I'm sure, many times during this podcast as well. Yeah. But can you imagine like the big reveal in a Star Wars movie like Luke Skywalker? <laughs> yeah. No, that would have been... And like Sabayoth is a good villain and Thrawn is a, is a great villain, but none of them are as evil as the, em- as the Emperor. So it would be super weird to go from you know, the setup of the, of like the first six movies to, you know, fighting basically Thrawn and Sabioth, who's like a shittier emperor, basically. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of Thrawn being an actual good villain does come from Zahn's later work with him. I don't disagree. Uh, he's a, he is a bit two dimensional mm-hmm. in, uh, especially out of the empire, but we get a lot more of like, evil mcbad guy thrown in this than we ever do in anything later uh especially in uh how he's talked about in the hand of thrawn duology uh and then even more with outbound flight where Mm -hmm. zen has an idea of like how he wants it all to tie together because he was basically in outbound flight tying together everything that had ever happened in star wars up to that point yeah Uh, and i think it works really well but it does involve some slight retconning to who thrawn was and why he was doing what he was doing Mm -hmm. um but yeah, and I mean, he definitely pl- he did sort of he made it easy on himself because he even plants a seed for the outbound flight in this book. Um, yeah, they they talk about it specifically, but like how that ties into uh, the Vong War, why Thrawn was going to the Empire at any point, mm-hmm. uh, his exile, yeah, uh, what a chiss is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's kind of surprising we've we've, I mean, we've got some information about it, but still a lot of his like sort of pre-campaign time and like the chiss ascendancy and like making the empire of the hand is still kind of mysterious Mm -hmm. uh i think that would have been a cool there's i think there's would have been room there for for some stuff like i more of the empire of the hand generally i think would have been good have you ever read 
Uh, like choices of one, allegiance. The yeah, other. yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. That's about as much as we ever get of yeah. his time. At the, and like, I think a lot of it speaks to just Zahn's improvement as a writer and how his style changed from uh, from this point, which are some of his earlier books, mm-hmm. uh, to things like Outbound Flight, where uh, the characters do become a lot more nuanced, and that says a lot more about about him rather than necessarily like. Like, there's gonna be a lot of just there's gonna be a lot of stuff that I'm somewhat critical of with this. Uh, with the Thrawn trilogy in general, but it's more comparing it to yeah. what Zahn becomes later. Like, I still mm-hmm. love these books, but there is some stuff that sticks out that I don't think are choices he would have made uh, in later. Like, if he were to rewrite the Thrawn trilogy now, which he kind of is uh, to an extent, but we're going to talk about that, mm-hmm. uh, that I think it would be even better than in, than what we got, which is still really good. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where I come from with it. I think what this book... No, I, I agree totally. This book is kind of lack, not lacking on nuance. Well, maybe lacking on nuance. I think one of the reasons why it's so loved is because he kind of nails the world building. Yeah. He nails the... Uh, I think he I think he actually nails the main characters pretty well. Um, although maybe a bit too reliant on the original trilogy. Um, but... He, he makes like he he sets up a compelling universe, and mm-hmm. then you're right. Later on, he makes Thrawn as a character much more interesting. Um, like reading the Thrawn duology, especially like the parts where they're on the, like at the hand of Thrawn, like the fortress, has to be some of the most like exciting stuff in Star Wars. Mm-hmm. I think, like like where they're learning about like Thrawn's machinations and like his pre- like him preparing to return and like the the outsider threats that he's like been getting ready for um and like that's that works i think because this book kind of in this trilogy and everything else sort of give credit to it. like they they give it a pedestal to stand on i guess yeah and the and credibility i guess like he does really well with established characters he does really well with characters like pelion and basically anyone who's not Card. i think thrawn and savioth because yeah. he was i think I think he was a bit too concerned with trying to make them out to be as big a threat as they were that yeah. in certain areas he'd go into uh, overemphasizing either how bad they were, or how competent they were. Mm-hmm. Um, and that those are, there's, I think just two parts in this book that really stand out to me as like taking a good premise, good premise, good premise falls off a cliff. And, and then the first one you're going to say, <laughs> There, there's Sable. two that I, I go off on fairly often. And Mark Sable and Kashyyyk, those are my guesses. Yes. Yeah, the ship okay. transfer and the <laughs> yeah. and the art. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the Mark Sable... Actually, three. Places. There, there's, a, there's something with Louis Van. Let's, okay. All right. Should we... I mean, but they do... Yeah, okay. Should we, should we just start off with uh, plot? And maybe... Uh, yeah. Like, like we, we can start right off with Marg Sable unless you want to talk a little bit about, um, like, maybe we should set the scene, I guess, first. Like, what's going on in the universe yeah. and whatnot. Um, Sounds good. So the New Republic, th- by this point, they've killed Zinj. And they how how, how far is this after? Um, I after think this episode? is one year after. I right. think Zinj, one, maybe two, because I think this is early 9 ABY. Uh, Zinj was like 8.5, 7.5 to 8.5. Mm-hmm. But right. I could be slightly off on that. So by this point, the New Republic is like they're not really dealing with external threats. Um, they're really just trying to like get their shit together. Like there's a lot of discourse like within the or discord within the like ruling council. They've, there's like it's almost like factionalism. There's like Borsk Failia and and Admiral Akbar really are vying for control and. More than that, though, there's like a lot of logistic problems with like setting up this like new republic. A lot of the early book is about well, all the book really is about them trying to get like the infrastructure back in place. Like there's the 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 empire spent a lot of time getting you know shipping lanes set up. So the new republic is trying to deal with that. They're trying to deal with bringing new planets into the new republic. Um, just setting up how to govern and how to rule. Um, which I guess it's less dangerous than um, like less mortally dangerous than fighting Imperial warlords. But I think it does a good job of showing that 
the New Republic is literally it comes near cracking a few times. Um, no cracking. I don't think he comes up in this book. <laughs> cracking a few times throughout this uh, trilogy. Yeah, and they they focus a lot more definitely on it, like kind of swapping places with the Empire is something that comes up yeah. a lot, where they're yeah. now the legitimate government and the Empire is the one that's kind of going to the subterfuge and guerrilla warfare tactics that they used to go for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because the, they say specifically that the Empire down to territory. And um, Thrawn, yeah, Thrawn, Thrawn behaves like a rebel for much of this book. He does like hidden faith attacks and stuff. Um. But it starts off on Coruscant, or is is Coruscant the very first scene actually, or is that the, no? I, I think it's uh, I think Mark Sable is the first Mark scene Sable, of the book. Okay. Uh, Obra Let's Sky. talk about that then. Yeah, so the library world of Abroa Sky, which is actually pretty prominent in Legends after this point. I mean, this book be- between this book and the West End Games source books, this is like where half of everything in Legends comes in, yeah. more than half. Like the ma- the majority of Legend stuff comes from like. So Abroa Sky is basically like it's mentioned in Plagueis too, um, quite significantly. Um, but uh, Thrawn, it starts off Thrawn has just done a raid on it, which happens. We don't actually see it. I guess it's one of his. I, I didn't quite remember how that happens. Is it? There's like another Star Destroyer performing the raid. I think isn't that what happens? Hmm. And then yeah, basically they get they get enough information for the uh, for Thrawn to start his campaign, but are pursued by like a new Republic task force. Yeah. So for, uh, for assault frigates show up, uh, mm-hmm. commanded by an Elaman. Mm-hmm. This is very significant for reasons <laughs> that I will hate later. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's four frigates versus one star destroyer. The implication is that this is supposed to be a very clear victory for the assault frigates. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Thrawn through superior tactics and absolute bullshit is able to win. Yeah. Uh, but you yeah, just did a it, video about this actually. So I did, I did do a video on it. So they say there's four wings of X wings too, but I think Zahn is a little free with like some of his starfighter um, terminology. Yeah. He did not like, give uh, Michael Stackpole a call with this book. No. And I like, I don't think a wing is supposed to be, I, like I just said, it's 36. Um, there's a source somewhere that says New Republic fighter wings at 36 fighters. Um, he might have meant squadron. I, I think either he way, did. I think it's yeah. I think it's because uh, each assault frigate is supposed to carry one squadron, and mm-hmm. then he called a squadron a wing. Is what I'm assuming yeah, happened. I'm pretty sure on a, on a later occasion he calls he he misuses the word squadron as well. Either way. Um, yeah, that's when Thrawn's going to hit the bar with his squadron of boys, right? <laughs> Him, Pelion, just, Rook. It's just Thrawn and Pelion and Rook. It's not a squadron. It really bothers me about canon, too. They've got black squadron. It's like six dudes. <laughs> well, six people. There's women, but... Um, what was oh, yeah. So, so they're outnumbered. They're outgunned. And um, Thrawn, basically, he is studying art. Presumably, he knows it's an Elam in, or an Elam commanding the fleet or likely to command them. And he sus- I, yeah, he suspects it and then confirms it with confirms uh, his it, yeah. first yeah. maneuver. So basically he's he, he challenges them with one of his scout TIE fighters and they blow a couple up and he's like, okay, Elaman commands this task force and he basically employs a strategy which although, which is basically perfectly fit for the situation and which utterly destroys them. Yeah, it's supposed to be a uh, like a kind of disorganized strategy, and yeah. the implication is that the Elamen are too structured of a speech. Uh, they uh, they they don't understand when things aren't structured. I guess. Yeah. And just him studying art and knowing the Elamen knows make, means he knows that they're not going to be able to do anything about this strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's going yeah. to absolutely destroy them based on that. And they they could have he could have just as effectively just used everything, taken out the art, taken out the fact that he knew it was that species, and the spe- mm-hmm. scene would have worked much better. Because yeah, it because we we get we there aren't really that many scenes when we get Thrawn actually using tactics. A lot of it's grand strategy. Like later on, he does that thing with the uh, what 
like he holds the ship in place and uses it as a shield. But other than that, like you're right. It would have been cool just to see him go in and just like annihilate somebody with some like esoteric bit of <laughs> naval strategy yeah. or whatever. Like the, the stuff that Thrawn does best. I, this is something that I think the new Thrawn trilogy and the new canon does much better is mm-hmm. uh, it explains his thought process in a way that actually makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and where it's like he's open about like I am taking I'm making deductions that are high risk high reward or that yeah. I think are low risk high reward yeah. or if they're high risk they're high reward and I kind of understand the risk I'm taking with that mm-hmm. and it's creative thinking in the moment like he does the thing with the buzz droid in the first Thrawn book uh, there's even stuff he does in this book like the 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 ship tractor beam kind of shielding thing that you were talking yeah. about yeah. uh and I think that all works really well. And there are even some of the cases where the stuff I'm going to complain about has those elements where it's like mm-hmm. he starts off like, okay, he's making this deduction, this deduction, this deduction, that's all good. And then he throws in this piece of absolute crap that mm-hmm. literally makes no sense. And I'd be even fine with having it be just impenetrable thrawnness and we don't find out what his reasoning is, but it ends up working <laughs> and having that element of of mysterious mystique, whatever about him. But instead, it's like, yeah, that kind of hey, Pelion, art. we're going to yeah. do this. Oh, yeah. Why are we doing that, sir? Well, I understand we're that they're going to do art. this. And and yeah. uh, I have been in this situation before where I learned this thing. Like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And also, mm-hmm. I heard once that one plus one equals three and then <laughs> done. Yeah, it, it works in some cases like it works when he's um, like. He, the Sluis Vaughn rate, a bit of that works because he's like he knows how this like like how like the Sluisy will will operate when it comes to like letting ships in and stuff. But no, that right. that's just as bad like because like either? it's like going to the DMV and saying I know that's run by humans, so I know how mm-hmm. long I'm going to wait exactly. So we don't need someone who can coordinate with perfect timing for this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I, I see your point. Um. Like when I thought of this battle, the way I the way I kind of imagine, like because they do the Marg Sable, the fighters kind of lose, like the incoming X wings kind of lose. Um, they stop focusing on the fighters, and then they kind of come around the side and just annihilate them, and like move on and destroy the capital ships. But you know, there's you're right. There, it, like it, not a lot of it makes sense, and I'm not a big fan of that battle. I'm less bothered by like the Kashyyyk stuff, but yeah. He's very, uh, it ends up with the other species being very uh, reductionist as like, mm-hmm. this is what they are, this is what they do in a way that uh, doesn't end up applying to humans or Chiss or... Because right. when it's a human, it's like, this is what Han Solo even. does. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of a problem with a lot of Star Wars stuff and it mm-hmm. kind of comes from here. And it's just, it... Even if they didn't explain why they were doing these things, maybe that would work better. But the problem is with all three instances, he explains it too much and it ends up being like an explanation that just does not work. Yeah. If they'd stopped two sentences earlier, mm-hmm. fine. But they go those extra two sentences and it's just dumb. On the other hand, what I do think works is the way he sets up and you only get a very little bit of this the way he's setting up his overall plan against the mm-hmm. new republic like the puzzle pieces he's getting into place basically uh, i like that part um yeah because that's like a kind of that shows like for example when you read this book maybe probably when you read this book for the first time you like okay battle of a bro sky why did he even do that but when you like read it later on you know that okay he is doing this so he can find the location of Wayland, or, or I don't remember if it's for Wayland or Merker. I think it's for Wayland. It's for Wayland. And you know he needs the Islamari for not only fighting Jedi, but he needs all of them for cloning purposes. And you know that he needs all of those clones because he's looking for the Katana fleet. And it's just like, or maybe his original plan was to use Rebel fleets regardless. It, I think it works much better by the time you get to Last Command and you sort of see how everything has um, has kind of progressed and how he's taken all these little pieces kind of scattered across the galaxy and, uh, you know, made a, like a legitimate claim yeah. to the, yeah. Like with the cloning thing, actually, that's one of the things that I were, or one of the things I think works really well mm-hmm. when you go and do rereads of it, because so much of Pelion scenes are talking about like, 
uh, discipline and experience has kind of been worn down. We're kind of just getting the dregs of uh, whoever we've conscripted. So how can we even blame them for not being that good at their jobs? Right. And what Thrawn is doing is basically a direct solution to that, where we can kind of see that through what Pelion says, even if Thrawn doesn't come out and uh, directly explain it. So I thought that worked really well. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, anything else for Abroa? Um, anything else for Abroa? I don't think so. Um, oh, one thing that Star Wars, that this book really uses, and I, I mentioned this in the X-Wing books, is the idea of etheric rudders. Um, did you notice that he mentioned those a lot? No. As like a, it's like a ship part. Um, so I was reading up on this because, you know, physics in Star Wars operate in just generally, it's probably not a good idea to look into the physics of Star Wars because there's no, for example, like there's no relativity when it comes to traveling near or beyond the speed of light or whatever else, uh, or near supermassive objects or whatever else. Um, in The Last Jedi, for example, or in anything Star Wars you see, for example, if a ship turns off its engines, it stops, even if it's in space. And space itself kind of behaves in a really weird way with how the fighters work. So, um, one, uh, and I'm, I'm not really very knowledgeable about physics and that might come through. But um, one idea was basically, and I read a really nice re write up of this on Reddit somewhere. I'll try to remember to link it when I put this video live. Or well, I'll probably do a video on, of it on my own eventually. Um, that the Star Wars universe, the uh, the space has like an ether, like a like almost like a physical aspect to it. That's why if you are in a fighter and you slow down that... Uh, or if you're in a fighter and you turn off your engines, that you eventually slow down, or why you can pull these kind of weird turns without stopping and turning, or why um, you know space carries sound. I guess it was initially a uh, um, a theory of real life physics that obviously didn't pan out, um, and I guess the old West End games and maybe uh, Timothy Zahn were for a while considering making something like that a more uh, like a more significant part of the canon, but it did kind of largely get dropped later on. Yeah, they they actually, uh, if you read Riptide and Crosscurrent, uh, you find out that space is actually just full of midi chlorians, and that's what they're. <laughs> that's I, one hundred percent made that up. For well, I mean, the idea with like the eighth, the the ether is that it's like basically a, a force or like a, it like. It basically connects the whole, like all of mm -hmm. space and all of the universe. So it, it would kind of play into that idea. Um, but yeah. Ultimately, obviously, Star Wars didn't go that way. And it's probably better that you don't over examine that sort of stuff because it's just, it's too, like, it's, it's just, you don't need, like, I don't want them to talk about why you hear sound in space. I don't like, sometimes they talk about how, like, there's sound reproducers in the ship or whatever. Just, like, ignore yeah. it. And, and that's that's kind of the same idea, the flip side of what I'm talking about with some of Thrawn's stretches. Like, I'm I don't even necessarily have a problem with him doing the stuff. It's just yeah. then they explain it in, and then you have to really think about it. <laughs> and then yeah, and then the explanation falls flat, and exactly. it turns into a just it, it's 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 ultimately a series about space wizards. So yeah. I'm being I'm fine with being told that these are things that can happen and these are things that do happen. Mm -hmm. But then when they try to ground it too much, like that Star Wars is science exactly. fantasy or space fantasy, space opera mm -hmm. rather than science fiction. So it, it's really not in its wheelhouse when it mm -hmm. goes and tries to do those things. Like there are some uh, science fiction, more traditional science fiction authors that uh, write Star Wars books and they handle it really well. And we got, a, I think a bit of that did show up with like medical tech in uh, MedStar. But mm -hmm. on the whole, I think Star Wars doesn't do well when explaining itself too much. I agree. Um, I, I guess it's like, you get some of that with like um, Black Fleet Crisis, if I remember correctly, is really science heavy and some of it just kind of falls yeah. flat. In, yeah. That... <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate Black Fleet Crisis. You really don't like it, do you? I don't enjoy it. It. I don't hate it. Mm. I just don't enjoy it. As a so as sort of a an example of 
because I guess the way you're explaining Thrawn might seem abstract to people, but I, I think what your point is, if you, yeah, like when you over explain something, then you bring too much of the logic in and the logic is pretty easily like waved away. Like uh... as an example, when it comes to like sound, like I talked about the sound um, reproducers, then how come every every time a ship is disabled or someone's floating in space, they still hear sound? It's like when you start to bring the logic in, you open it too far for, um, I, I guess you expose kind of the issues with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to find the quote, if I can, uh, for when they're transferring, because that's the other thing that I haven't mentioned yet that just always is stupid to me. When they're doing the transfer for Kashyyyk. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm going to find the exact... It's a long quote. quote. It's really dumb. I I just want to find the exact it's place like where I start game. having a problem. <laughs> yeah. It's honestly like, like a logic game. Like It reminded me of studying for the LSAT. Like, where it's like, George needs to sit next to Carly, but Carly doesn't want to sit in the middle. It's like... <laughs> yeah. So they're leaving the Killen. Uh, this is jumping ahead quite a bit, but it's within the same theme of what we're talking about. So I think it's probably better to bring it up now. But uh, they're leaving Nikhilin where they've just met with Lando. Uh, Leia, they, they've started to understand the kind of threat that Leia's under and that they're going after Leia. Um, so they're, they're deciding to split up and they're trying to do it in a way that Thrawn won't be able to, or they don't know who Thrawn is, but that the Empire won't be able to track or expect as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they have two ships, Lady Luck and... Millennium Falcon, they have Lando, Han, Leia, 3PO, uh, Chewie, Chewie. and where's my ebooks folder? Because I, I I'm gonna search in that. But the the plan that they end up coming up with is that uh, Han and Lando are going to take the Millennium Falcon, and they're going to go, they end up going to Obrego Ray trying to track down a slicer uh, that they can use to kind of hide Leia better and still hack into uh, New Republic diplomatic transmissions so they can, so that she can stay tuned in to what's going on in the galaxy, but still be hidden and safe without anyone knowing where she is. Which and this is a good point. should have been able to get some sort of certificate from the New Republic. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Well, then whoever gave them the certificate is going to be uh, in on the play. Basically, they want to keep this as quiet as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it, it does make sense, but God, sort of. I don't have an EPUB reader anymore. That sucks. Winter could have probably done this. But, <laughs> but <laughs> Leia is going to go to Kashyyyk, and she's going to go with Chewie. Yeah. 3PO is going with... Uh, with Lando Han and Lando, and, and yeah. they kind of program her. Uh, or C three PO, yeah, sound they, like they program C three PO to sound like her. So she's mm-hmm. so three PO is able to uh, impersonate her really well. And she basically, so far, uses, um, <laughs> what's it called again? Um, where they do those uh, fakes? Uh, uh, deep fake. It yeah, it's like a deep fake Leia voice. It's actually just a Leia soundboard. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> one of those old ventrilo harassment videos. We got a transmission from Leia, but she just kept asking if I'm a little short for a stormtrooper. <laughs> all she's saying is, "Who is your daddy, and what does he do?" <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Arnold soundboards. I don't know. <laughs> she's not a to get to the chopper. <laughs> I lied, but. <laughs> Did you, did you find the exact quote where you lose it? No, and I was very impressed with my ability to fill that time until this point, and it's all just falling apart. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? I had something to add, but I mean, it is kind of it is kind of interesting. This book, one of the, I guess, one thing I really don't like about some books, TV shows, etc., is like when one character is pulling like some sort of clear like ruse and the other character spends like half of their arc, like messing around with that ruse. Um, like if, if it had spent a ton of time with the Imperials chasing Leia somewhere, she didn't existed. I would have found that tiresome. Yeah. And in this book, it's just like they, they spend like probably 10 pages just like getting C3PO set up. And then Thrawn's just like, nah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, like, I don't think so, bitch. 
Yeah, I, I end up I like what happened with that because it, it was as much to fool the New Republic as as Thrawn, yeah. and it didn't work on Thrawn. It was a good way to show that like Thrawn is beyond their their little tricks, yeah. but oh yeah, uh, but it still gets the job done with uh, what the the main hero trio. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, so I wasn't it, it able to actually open the too, the ebook. Is the problem right oh, now, okay. Ghostfish? I'm okay. looking for the page number of the actual I'll see book. If I can get it online. But I mean, it kind of works the other way too. Like people, like there's not a lot of BS. Like it, it's it's honestly just like who does whatever they're doing better because like it's it's similar with the uh, same thing when okay, they get to Merker. Okay, you got it. All right, let's hear it. Um. Consider the possibilities, Thrawn said, leaning back in his chair. Three people start aboard the Millennium Falcon, one aboard the Lady Luck. Three people then... Tra- so, first off, he can't be sure of that. Yeah. Three people then transferred, but neither Solo nor Calrissian is the type to tra- turn his ship over to the dubious command of a computer or droid. So each mm-hmm. ship must end up with at least one person aboard. But we also hear multiple times, multiple times in this book, how Lando slave rigs everything. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I didn't think about that. So Thrawn starts off with like so many wrong assumptions. Mm-hmm. And even up to that point, though, whatever. Uh, you know what it reminds me of, though? That the the like logic game where it's like you've got a goat and a tiger and a fisherman. You've got to get them all across the river, but you can't leave the goat and the tiger together. Yeah. You can't leave the fence just like, just like that. <laughs> and he times how long it takes for them to transfer. And it's like four and a half minutes or something yeah and he's basing so much of this on those assumptions and how long they're tethered together yeah and like if he just said patience captain as you say the question now is the final makeup of the cruise fortunately once we know that there were three transfers which he couldn't know just leave that part out uh there are only two possible combinations either solo and organa solo are together aboard the lady luck or else organa solo and the wookie are there unless Mm -hmm. one of the transfers was a droid unlikely historically uh, Solo's never like yeah, droids. That's, the one, that's the one that really I didn't like. Solo's got droid. Like it, when it comes to you know, Han Solo would do whatever it needed to protect his wife. <laughs> yeah. Travel with the droid. Like shut. You can shut a droid off. Like this is a scene that is pure addition by subtraction. Yeah. We get rid of a few lines and it works. But mm-hmm. because they went into such depth to explain the nonsense that is contradicted even within the book to try to make Thrawn just look omnipotent and omniscient mm. it it just cheapens him as a character and it's hard for me to get past that this yeah. bothers me so much yeah and, and this is something that they like you said thrawn really improves in like where his like abilities come from like they're, they, they become much more grounded even in canon uh but someone in the chat said it's kind of like thrawn's the kind of guy who does the math wrong we get the answer right we get only gets yeah. half points <laughs> uh but yeah but it i i like to compare it to the to the buzz droid thing because i think that's this point where eli is even like uh how did you know that like i i didn't know that but i made these assumptions <laughs> but i was right wasn't i <laughs> uh, this is the chance i took this is the assumption i was working off of and that assumption is usually like he starts out with like his factual basis for what he's doing, which in this Mm -hmm. book he's doing, but he's wrong about those factual bases. Yeah. And then he just says stuff that doesn't make any sense. Uh, And that you could literally like the fact that Pelion doesn't call him an idiot for thinking some of this stuff is just, (laughs) he thinks it though. (laughs) It, he's basically like this dude, like what the hell? (laughs) Yeah. And again, I'm harping on this stuff, but this is like the three parts of the book that I don't like compared to the rest, which I love. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying I hate the book. It's just these are things that I think are super simple to fix. They're things that I think that Zan did fix in his writing going forward. And yeah. that's kind of why I focus on it so much. But yeah. I guess we need the uh, the, Thr- the Thrawn Trilogy Special Edition. I'd be okay with that. With more Utini, or not more Utini, more, uh, what's, what's the sound that, that uh, Loom Clunky or whatever, that McClunky? sound that, yeah, yeah George recently <laughs> added. <laughs> um, I, I love how 
people are always like, we need George, we need George back. And then George does like just classic George Lucas shit. <laughs> <laughs> like George Lucas works really well on a creative team where he has yeah. other people that can be like, mm, <laughs> maybe we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, let's move on, though. Oh, one yeah. thing actually I do want to note is that they have Thrawn, after, after the end of the uh, first battle, uh, he's drinking ale, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's Is it even specified to be Corellian ale? Because we get Corellian ale, no, but I think it's not only Corellia gets ale. No, it's. I mean, it might, it might just be, I don't know if they actually use the word ale, it's some sort of beer, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> what if Thrawn just spent the whole book trashed and we didn't know it? <laughs> That's like that's like um when when Han leaves Leia and like him and Lando go out. I'm like, man, this this could go two ways. This is like, yeah, okay, Lando and Han might be productive, or they just go to like, I don't know, like Narshada and just get shit faced. <laughs> uh, break it over and just get shit faced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we were totally looking for that slicer. <laughs> I like to imagine that that's the uh, that's like the the stuff that happened off screen. Yeah, the the time span that Leia seems to be on uh, on Kashyyyk does seem to be a bit longer than the mm -hmm. like we get two main we get basically two days worth of events for Han and Lando. So there's a lot of days where they weren't doing it. Like we don't know a what lot they of were travel up to. time though too. This yeah. this book's pretty heavy on travel time, but like while they are traveling, like you might as well get messed up, right? Like you think they were playing burial card on the Falcon? I think they're playing episode one pod racing. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's a good idea, Corey. <laughs> Charlie wouldn't know how to play. Perfect. He doesn't know how to play Burial Card either, so it's fine. Um, let's move on, though. Let's talk about Coruscant, shall we? We should. This is one of the things from uh, or the EU that did get picked up for. Yeah, it's like it. There are other examples, but this is like the thing. It's a pretty major yeah. thing, too. Um, we've, we talked about this before, but Coruscant itself, is like as a concept, it wasn't invented by Zahn. Um, basically comes from early ideas for Return of the Jedi. Um, but the name, this is the fact that they brought the name into the movies is pretty unreal, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but, but yeah, so Coruscant, and like in... Dark Empire 1, they call it Imperial Center, I think. Um, they have, like, the same idea for a planet, but I guess they would have been separate at the time. Um, yeah, it's kind of like... Imperial Center is kind of like the whole Bastion, yeah. uh, Sartananian thing, where... Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, of course, yeah, l later later books use them interchangeably, but kind mm -hmm. of interesting. Um, but yeah, we get, we get Coruscant. It's a little less... Um, I, I, like, it's, it's, it's still a planet-wide city, but... It's a little less extreme. Like to me, I didn't get the idea that it's supposed to be like um, sixty tiers of, of yeah, and like there's a, like the Minari Mountains are described much like yeah, like I, I read something that Zahn kind of imagined that the planet still had a bit of wildlife on it. Yeah, it, it's uh, kind of like the the version of Coruscant that we hear about with like the the polar ice cap skiing that they yes. go on, uh, as opposed to like, is that the, it? Yeah. Is that um, Han and what's his name that does that? I thought it was a family trip with Han and Leia, but I haven't read that in so long. That... Uh, can't remember. Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious now. Isn't that Han and Kip Duran? I thought that went skiing. Maybe I forgot about that whole. Yeah, because isn't that right when Kip comes to Coruscant for the first time? Yeah. Goes... Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, it was bound to happen eventually. Yeah, I've been waiting. Um, so, so Luke sees Obi Wan for the last time, and I took a note that uh, Ben says that he loved Luke like a son. He's like a brother, a son, and a student. I loved you like all those, and I'm just like, boy, you know him for that long. <laughs> kind of just watching him for most of his life, or like running into him at the grocery store. It's like, yeah, oh, well, hey, hey, Ben Kenobi, and he's just, like, crying. He's like, oh, we don't know how often they had uh, some interrupt, some force interactions, maybe, like, every, once a week, Obi-Wan would just show up, and, because it seems like Yoda and, and Obi-Wan were hanging out a lot. We don't know. 
Yeah, they were Skyping. In the Lego Lego Star Wars Adventures Yoda Chronicle stuff, you get the scenes of like Qui Gon, Obi Wan, and Yoda, where they just treat oh, yeah. Qui Gon like complete trash. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, do you want to? Th- so, what what do you think about the setup of like the New Republic movie Coruscant? I think that's a cool idea. Like they they set up literally right in the Imperial Palace. Yeah, I think it works later when it's Mm -hmm. we get like more about the old republic and kind of like reclaiming symbols yeah Uh, but with this it uh there is kind of that reclamation thing but it just seems weird that they wouldn't because luke mentions how he's like very clear with them that yeah this is bad this is a bad idea and Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be fine and it'll be fine Mm -hmm. but uh i do like the whole repurposing of those symbols reclaiming all that stuff uh, but I, I do think if you have the only Jedi in the galaxy that you're aware of saying, maybe don't do this, you maybe don't do this. <laughs> but he's like, don't do this, but I can't explain why. <laughs> but I do like later, they kind of deal with that later on too. Like in Fate of the Jedi, Luke is like, nah, we're gone. And he just like moves the, the Jedi Order off course. And he's like, Nah, screw this planet, dog. <laughs> all the Jedi leave. <laughs> but, uh... You know that planet with all the dark side temples? I'm going there and taking all your <laughs> children with me. I do like how uh, Plagueis talks about that a lot, too, and how, like, um... How Coruscant's basically like a shithole and, like, nothing important should be there. <laughs> it's just, like, for Coruscant, it's like, um... I forget what to talk about. It's, it's basically like politicians, if they're on Coruscant, they eventually find their way in the Undercity and um, like nasty stuff starts happening to them and like they start taking bribes and stuff. The Jedi, there's like lingering dark side power and shit. Um, yeah, Coruscant is basically like the tourist districts and cities where it's like mm-hmm. there's, it's so much trash just with a slight <laughs> coat of paint over it to make it look yeah. semi-appealing. Yeah. As someone from Niagara, it, that's... That's the analogy I go for. <laughs> oh, so like the Jedi Temple would be like that like museum that's there? Yeah, between the Jedi Temple and uh, the Senate, like whatever that, the way of whatever with all the sculptures. Mm-hmm. I forget what it's called. I should know mm-hmm. that. But that is the, the good area. Visitor's tax. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> see, you you know that. That's Yeah, uh, I knew it. I, I did not pay it. They I went to like, I don't know if it's a, no, like a Jack Astor's or something. And they were mm-hmm. like, okay, we got. It was probably the, the Boston pizza like, on Clifton Hill. I was like, no, I'm not paying this extra. It's literally 20% tax. Or is Eastside, no, Eastside Marrows. You guys have Eastside Marrows out there? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there's, Eastside there's one in, my, uh, my dad's uncle actually used to own that wax museum. It was weird. Wow. Because, so they're. Yeah, so like there's there's the one street in Niagara Falls, Ontario that's nice and that's presented mm-hmm. to tourists. The rest of the city is just drugs. <laughs> Man, I got one of the drunkest I've been in my entire life at Niagara Falls. That's that's standard. <laughs> it was the it was the but it was a funny situation. And if you guys are going to be subscribed to this podcast, you got to be ready for tangents and stuff. But it was when I was working as a lawyer in Ontario. There was like a big government lawyers summit. And I don't know if I told you the story before, maybe, but it was the night of um, the U.S. election where Donald Trump right. won. And when things started kind of going the way they went, as, as you can imagine, Canadian government lawyers in Ontario aren't largely Donald Trump fans. But uh, anyway, either way, the uh, the election was just it was entertaining because it wasn't you know like people expected. So. The bar, the uh, we were at a hotel and, and initially it was like um, they give you two drink tickets, but you know there's a lot of lawyers who don't drink because, to be honest, there's a lot of issues with um, substance abuse in the law. So I like I was just racking up drink tickets. You know I I had probably eight drink tickets by the end of the night, and then eventually when the election started getting real interesting, they brought kegs out, and that like that night I just remember <laughs> and I woke up the next day. I'm like, oh my God. I just like walk outside. It's like Niagara Falls. Like I missed every meeting I had that morning, like everyone did. And I just, <laughs> I was just wandering, <laughs> just wandering, just like as hungover as I've ever been in my entire life. 
And I just found this like Burger King in the middle of a casino and just had one of those like chicken whoppers they had for a while. And it was like one of the worst experiences of my life, <laughs> but also kind of awesome at the same time. <laughs> that No, that sounds like a standard Niagara experience. Yeah. Even living Yeah, that's there. what I was thinking. I was like, this is, this is kind of what I expect. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a... Uh... That that street has a lot of bars, but then if you leave that street, everything else is also bars. Like I grew up in a place called Chippewa, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of like a little village off to the side of Niagara Falls. Right. Uh, so it's pretty much all residential. There's probably a couple thousand people in that part of town, but mm -hmm. like it very small. But there's an area of about two main streets, and there are thirteen bars at its peak beautiful there you couldn't not i think it's you leave a bar you walk for about 500 meters you're at another bar no matter what mm -hmm. direction you go in until you get to the river right and there's and, people drinking down there too <laughs> well obviously those are the people down um, there. they get their two what, what, what time do like restaurants landing? close there and stuff is it two in the morning uh for the most part yeah still sounds greasy it's it does sound like Argyle easy. Street in Halifax, Laser, yeah. But yeah, uh, Star Wars. Yeah. Coruscant is Niagara Falls confirmed. That's basically what we're going for there. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with that. It's like if Niagara Falls was like a bit denser. <laughs> I do like the... I do kind of like how Coruscant is like... they've The New Republic has a real like base though, you know what I mean? Like Coruscant's yeah. kind of like home. Like uh, if, you're, if like you're leaving somewhere, you're going to Coruscant, you know? Yeah. Like, that's where they operate out of. That's where all the politics is. It's it's a nice kind of central location that kind of, especially where like, if you think about it, the original trilogy doesn't really have many planets that you can like rely on for, for um, you know, like a setting. Yeah, he he goes to Dagobah, and sometimes you go to Hoth or Tatooine. Like I guess they go to Tatooine in this book, uh, or wherever else. But or Endor, they go in book two, I think. But um, yeah, there's no regular planets in the movies exactly. until the prequels. Yeah, so they had Zahn had to invent a planet that we would, you know, not just, you know, you read something like a Broa Sky and you're like, what the hell is that? Um, he made like a memorable planet that, like, I don't know, he does a good job of making it seem like their home, I guess. Yeah, and it kind of plays into what we were talking about earlier with, uh, uh, specifically just being the established power. They're stuck on Coruscant and uh, yeah. they're kind of tracking the Imperials now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the reason for the use of like the former Imperial uh, facility things, which also is an issue with uh, Delta Source. I can't remember if it had anything to do with the fact that it was taken over Imperial stuff that they originally got it. Um, There's a Delta Source reference in this book, too. Yeah. Well, that's basically how they're getting a lot of the information on mm -hmm. Leia and Akbar and. But they even say something Force. about the Luke's like they were nothing like the... Uh... The plants that we had in the Coruscant yeah. on the Imperial Palace, which I thought was funny. I would have loved if the the Delta Source plant turned out to be like a, a sentient, like Udnar or his species, <laughs> just sitting still for the whole time. Then and they find I'm a out Jedi he, Master. <laughs> he makes a break for it. <laughs> that would have made that scene so much better. Just like slithers out. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> It's just like one long plant, just like popping up through a few like little planters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, get out of here. You see him like <laughs> slither down into the undercity. <laughs> um, <sighs> that's funny. Uh, <laughs> the Republic has to hire. We get a whole series of a horticulturist trying to track this. <laughs> He's big and slimy. We'll find him. <laughs> This book doesn't really touch on that though. Not until the next one do we get like yeah. the the we get a bit of because a lot of this book is people being scared of Thrawn. Like he yeah he's like he is like nearly omniscient, omnipotent, omniscient. So they like we can't do anything. I can't take a dump without Thrawn knowing. Um, and if I like I remember when I first read the book as like an adult, I thought it was Winter who I, I think it kind of sets it up to Winter who's passing on a lot of the information mm -hmm. um but then you like nah it's just the plants and stuff yeah it's kind of the same as uh the mara stuff where mara stuff where you're supposed to think that 
Uh, she's upset at Luke for what happened at Jabba's palace. Yeah. Um, but see, I can't even evaluate that fairly because I like I, I've just always known what she, like yeah I mean, yeah. I I don't think I did when I first read the series. Like I I think there were a few Vong War books that I read before the Thrawn trilogy, right. but I wasn't really into it yet. Mm. Uh, so I I don't know what the time span was between it. Um, so I, th- I think I wasn't aware of what was going on with, uh, with Mara. So I, I think I probably did I know buy she's into a total the freaking pain in this book. She's like constantly just pissed. <laughs> like this whole book, it's just Mara being just, just, it's just Mara being real n- negative and unpleasant to be around. <laughs> yeah. I think part of that's because I listened to the audiobook book and, uh, and Thompson, Mark Thompson, just like every time he talks, he's just very sardonic, as uh, Timothy Zahn would say. She's she's actually pretty good with everything. Like, there's a lot of her with Luke, and yeah. she has a lot of reasons to hate Luke, which makes mm-hmm. sense. But the scenes that she just has with Card, where he doesn't come up, uh, are like she's usually fairly amicable until uh, Luke gets mentioned or the Emperor gets mentioned, and. Uh, like part of it is that card is like intentionally needling her trying to yeah. like want to tell me now want to tell me now want to tell <laughs> yeah. me now want to tell me now want to tell me now hey mara who's luke mara mara <laughs> mara why do you hate luke 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 why why does mara hate you and that's got to get frustrating yeah but there's also times where like he says something and she's like that's stupid and like she really doesn't respect the uh not that she doesn't res- she respects card but she's always like aggressively challenging him, I feel like. Um, mm-hmm. But but that's, that's probably one of the things he likes about her, I imagine. But it also usually does have to do, the challenging usually does have to do with, uh, like the really aggressive challenging is more to do with the rebels. Mm-hmm. So anything to do with like where they're keeping Luke, Han, Lando. Uh, yeah. And that that's the kind of, that's the stuff that we care about with the trilogy because that's the main plot we don't really need to hear about how she is uh, handling other parts of the organization in less yeah. relevant ways. So I never really had a problem with how she was handled in the series. Uh, I think the way she kind of warms up to Luke uh, is really good. I I do think part of why it works, though, is that she wasn't intended as a love interest for Luke. Right. <coughs> That's one thing I was going to mention, because, I mean, there is a bit of, and well, I'm sure we'll talk about this more by the time we finish, but there's a little, there's no romance between them. Although there's a couple scenes, like I, I could see being a Mara Luke shipper after this. There's like the scene where yeah. they're like hiding from the Empire <laughs> and she's got like the blaster up to his neck and he's like, I could feel her breathing on my neck. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> like, she's like, good thing you're in the. I could feel her breathing on my th- neck in a way that Gary will never did. <laughs> <laughs> good thing you're the little spoon, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And then Han makes a. Han and Luke basically have the same. Well, Han's like, "So, do you guys get up to anything in those woods there?" He's like, "It's pretty shit." <laughs> um, yeah, but the like Zen didn't intend for them to get together, really. Mm-hmm. And I, th- the fact that they, he wasn't like he made some allusions to that or just jokes about it, but mm-hmm. that ends up making it work long term in a way that if it had been like set up like this is going to be Luke's eventual girlfriend slash wife. Yeah. that we probably would have ended up in maybe more of a gross Callista situation. but Yeah, because they would have had the weird Bantam books trying to deal with it. So we get Luke, and so we get Mara and Lando together. <laughs> yeah, like we, we get enough yeah. of progression in there. That uh, that was fucked. Uh, <laughs> we get enough of progression in the relationship that it makes sense from where they're coming from. Yeah. But uh, we don't get those same strange leaps that we may have if it was set up as like, this is where it's supposed to be going long term. So I, yeah, like I really Luke did like get, how that was handled. Like, yeah, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> Luke's been hurt too many times by this point. Well, I guess it's only really been Gariel and um, Lumaya, really. Or what other love interests has he had? Uh, Lumaya, Gariel, um, Shira, Bree. Well, Lumaya. Um, yeah. And, the uh, what oh, the Leia. name of his Zelt- can't forget Leia. Yeah, there's that Zeltron in uh, in the old Marvel right. comics. I can't remember her name. Danny, I think she's cute. He missed out with her. Zeltron are best species. 
But I think the only one that we're really missing up to this point is just Callista. Yeah. She's much later. But Well, in the... What's her name? The one from... Oh, uh, uh, the... Oh, what's her name? I'm trying to remember the name of the, of the character. Remember when Luke tries to go find his mother and he's he goes off with... um. Oh, what was her name again? Oh, is is this Black Fleet Crisis? Yeah, yeah. What's her name again? Um, because, <laughs> because Luke, after um, in Fate of the Jedi, after Mara's dead, he almost kind of gets back together with her in a way. <laughs> I guess Tenennial too, in a in a way. Oh, Akana, Akana, because mm. yeah, she's Thana. Yeah, Tenennial Joe. Does get kind of yeah, just within the one book, but yeah. But then, like after Mara dies and Abeloth is inside Akana's body, I'm pretty sure it's Akana she takes over. Luke's like considering it. <laughs> like, only, only if Abeloth is still controlling her, though. Does he? Doesn't he have a love interest in Dark Empire as well? And puts Jay's brand. <laughs> Like I like my girl, like my girl's curvy, <laughs> all curves. <laughs> uh, I I don't. I haven't looked at anything Dark Empire for a long time. Any of the actual right. stuff, so I don't know. All right, all right. I can't remember. I thought there was like a Jedi, but isn't it? I can't. Remember. Kreia. Yeah, that was the one. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so what were, I forget what we're generally talking about other than this bullshit. You know, it's, it's actually kind of interesting. Well, I got an idea. Since we've been talking about like some of the past works, another interesting thing at this point, Luke is really angsty um, and he's kind of like really nervous more than anything. Anxious more than yeah. angsty. I actually really about... liked his characterization in in the books because it's like he's still Luke, but he's also like kind of meek and isn't really yeah. sure what he's going to be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's worried about training people because he's really worried about like making an excavator. Yeah. And he's also out of universe. Jim, we yeah, know by, by this point that uh, he's gotten every, every person he's tried to train killed or yeah. abandoned by them. I think it's a real uh, goddamn shame. We don't get a single reference to Deb Sabuara in this, <laughs> <laughs> even though it was written before or whatever. No, but the book takes place after it, so they could have mentioned him. <laughs> right, because I forgot all the literature. Handed. A... Yeah, if anything happens in universe after something else, then it's just naturally assumed that it was all known and planned and actually written mm -hmm. beforehand, so it could still be referenced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a few things I, I wanted to talk about with uh, like X-Wing that kind of play into this, and there, there's a few instances with it, but they... Uh, okay. The first one comes up, I'd say around here, but we're jumping around a bit anyways. All but right. uh, when they're talking about protecting Leia, uh, and it's something about getting, I think it's Rogue Squadron as an escort. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We had them four days ago. It didn't do us a lot of good. Commander Antilles and Rogue Squadron are fine in a space battle. Yeah, but this yeah. kind of stuff isn't exactly their area of expertise. We do better with uh, Lieutenant Page and some of those commandos. Yeah, so definite moment for Ray Squadron to shine. But of course, that and Page is in Page is in um, a couple of the Page's commandos are in a couple of the books as well. Yeah, uh, but this is like a if you want Rogue Squadron but more commandoy, we definitely Rogue we do Squadron. have a, a the the perfect product for you <laughs> using. Check Comes out with a giant off. horse as well. That's epic. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's a there's a few places in here where it's like stuff that Rogue Squadron or like the X Wing books definitely took inspiration from that mm -hmm. I thought was really cool. Like reading in retrospect, having just mm -hmm. covered those books, sure. uh, especially with the Battle of Suez fan, we get the interaction between uh, what's that Harkness Arcus Arcus Harkness. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I forget his name. Yeah, I, I think I have a typo here that's screwing me up. Angry, uh, but, angry New Republic uh, officer number. Yeah, and we're talking, like, we get a, a couple pages worth of Wedge, me like, uh, arguing with that guy, and he's like, oh, he I'd be upset too if I had a bunch of these uh, fighter jockeys sitting on yeah. my ship. And it's like, this is clearly 
involved in the planning for uh, or clearly came out in uh, the X-Wing stuff. And it's it's like getting a little X-Wing book vignette in the middle or towards the end of the book. And I loved it. We that even was... get the bit with Wedge um, where he's like, I, I, I'm wishing I had taken all those promotions that have yeah. been offered. We got that in Wraith Squadron number one quite a or Yes, Wraith Squadron quite a bit. Um, it's like the bet with Akbar. <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah. You're right. A nice little vignette there. Who would uh, Rogue Five have been? Because I think that's the one. Um, I'm pretty sure the uh, the comics, I, I'm I'm not a thousand percent sure on this, but I think the comics, the Thrawn comics came out significantly later. Yeah. Um, and I think they, they work with Rogue Squadron a bit to give them... Um, like more like like I think they draw characters like within the lore if that makes sense. Apparently by this time it would have been Rizadi. Okay. Or Aniri. Wait, aren't they dead? No, Aniri isn't dead. Lujane's dead. Oh right, yeah. Okay. Wrong Forge. Yes, Forge Sisters. Because Aniri was alive forever. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Rosati ever died. For me, like, once we get past the X-Wing series, the pilots, besides for, like, Corrin, um, yeah, basically lose them. <laughs> hmm. There's, like, there's a cutoff point for Rogue Squadron where I think after 9 ABY, no one's allowed to die. Yeah. So They're too epic. I think like Tycho, for example, is brought into the comic, but I can't remember correctly. Like I, maybe I'm just seeing someone with blonde hair. <laughs> There's only one person with blonde hair in Star Wars, so it's okay. That's just Tycho. <laughs> Not Luke. <laughs> Who's Luke? Uh, he's the a clone of a Jedi. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is he that that guy that like races those <laughs> things in in that other movie? the the one with uh with the double bladed thing oh no you're thinking of um Sebulba. okay uh right right yeah i'm glad we got that cleared out yeah if you have any more questions feel free to ask okay um so what exactly is a jedi all right let's move on i, I can't I, this is some basic stuff i can't i can't go to your level <laughs> right now <laughs> Uh, what did you think about about Angry Thrawn? So um, we get a couple instances of it, but the the main instance is uh, when Luke is that. yeah when Luke is uh, fleeing or leaving Nikilin or he's uh, go he's sorry he's going to Joe Mark because uh, Sabayoth has uh, spoken to him during oh, yeah. the assault on Nikilin. Uh This is where Thrawn is getting. All the mole miners that he's going to use to attack Slewis Fan and capture ships. Yeah. Uh, Sabayoth, who's kind of cooperating with Thrawn, and we haven't really talked about him. We should probably yeah. do that. But uh, Sabayoth is calling out to Luke, saying to come see him. Uh, Luke finds out he's going to Joe Mark. Thrawn kind of jumps to Joe Mark and jumps back to intercept Luke. Yeah. Uh, and Luke gets caught up by them, mm. ends up getting caught in their tractor beam, but using some creative proton torpedo. Madness. It's pretty cool. It actually, yeah. it actually made sense to me. Basically, yeah, like I liked the, it. The computer like follows the computer, which you, the the uh, tractor beam uses follows the ship. He basically puts on the uh, puts on the brakes and then fires a missile at the same time. So the computer briefly loses lock, and then thinking that he's the torpedoes, it follows the torpedoes and he can fly away. Yeah, and um, I there's so much that's done that I loved about this scene, like. The creative use of all that stuff, Luke getting away in like a in that creative way, in a skilled mm -hmm. fighter piloty way, uh, and then kind the of highlighting the stuff. Hmm? the introduction stuff. Yeah, like the way the way. Okay, I'm gonna say the way Thrawn, or sorry, the way Zon handles face in this trilogy has never been done nearly as well in any mm -hmm. other in any other thing. Um, like the way he talks about it being generally not very precise, but like the idea of like using interdictors to pull ships out. I mean, we do get that a bit actually in um, in uh, Wedge's Gamble, but yeah. not nearly to the same extent. But 
the way he just like all of that stuff works. I don't know how much of that was present in the West End game stuff, but he just absolutely nails it. And I don't think anyone has ever done it as well. Mm-hmm. But the the stuff it sets up with the problems with the umpire are really good too. Mm-hmm. Uh, where what Luke did was like really creative, and it probably should have worked. But then we yeah. we get the scene with Thrawn uh, where he's clearly miffed and goes yeah. talks to the guy who's responsible uh and you're like okay so once this happened what did you do what was your solution and the guy's like i yeah. did this is just, i just did what the computer said to do what are and it's like clearly they're not prepared for this situation they're not properly trained anymore uh we get a lot more of what pelian was talking about with uh the empire's discipline and uh their best officers are gone their best everything is gone yeah. and now they're stuck with just whatever they can churn out and we're yeah. seeing that here where it's like, okay, but what did you try to do to solve the problem? And the answer was basically nothing. Uh, so yeah. Thrawn calls over the guy who trained him and is like, okay, so what's the deal with this? Did was he you... prepared for it? Yeah. yeah. And so his... He's just finding the weak link, essentially. Yeah. He's like, how? what was involved in this person's training? What did you do to prepare them for thinking on their feet? What did you do to uh, prepare them for any of this? And the guy says, well, mm-hmm. I, I showed him the the training video about <laughs> it's basically Whatever. like your first week at a fast food restaurant where you get and those like training videos and that's all he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. but so what did you think about Thrawn's solution here being, yeah, I didn't, I didn't to agree. kill. So what I thought is that he would kill the guy who did the training. Yeah. And that's actually what I remembered happening too. Yeah, me too. Um, I I was like, okay, because I thought that the idea was that he's a perfectly competent, uh, like, he's not an officer, I guess he's an enlisted, he's perfectly competent, he's also conscripted too, because they're, they're very, they're very low on, uh, on people at this point, uh, which I want to talk about in a second. He did technically get some training on it, but it's just, I don't think anyone really needed to die, because I don't think anyone really did their their uh job incorrectly but if anybody i don't think it should have i think it should have been the officer in command because i don't think the guy was i don't think it was a mistake because thrones like there's a difference between an error and a mistake um and i don't think that the like I, I just think he wasn't prepared i don't think he had the capacity to deal with that situation yeah and it wasn't so much the uh the reacquisition of the target is the fact that they basically pulled in a uh, a proton torpedo where the, he reacquired something, but he didn't really right, yeah. bother to check what he was reacquiring. He was yeah. doing it relatively by the book on that. Yeah. And they made both of them made mistakes, but they could you could kind of see where the mistakes came from. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, yeah, I don't think he really should have killed either of them. And I think that kind of gets no. back to Thrawn falling into some of the some of the like worst parts of the empire where they're not right. valuing in, in my it. opinion in all of this Thrawn has like a pretty significant weakness in all three books and it's the way he treats those under under him he treats Pelion well and and he's open to Pelion um you know adding or whatever but when it comes to true subordinates whether it's the Nogri um or people like Talon Card or people that he thinks he should have power over, he is he treats them not necessarily cr- well. He treats them cruelly sometimes. Like when it comes to the Nogri, for example, he and that ultimately leads partly to his death. He doesn't like fully value them. Yeah, um, and that's not really something an aspect of his character that's carried over. Um, and I, I like I think that's meant to be the major because Thrawn's death is kind of ironic in the end because he's. He's such a student of art and he knows all these cultures. In the end, he dies because he doesn't fully understand, you know, one of the cultures that he works most closely with. So it's kind of ironic in that sense. And that irony in his death is really because, in my opinion, because of this weakness and how he views kind of like lesser mm. beings. And Yeah. And it, it's kind of at odds with what we get from Thrawn in, in the future, though, is where yes. it's... Cause if you take the Thrawn trilogy in a vacuum, then it works with uh, with how he's portrayed. Like he's portrayed consistently throughout that. But uh, the 
a lot of what happens no, I know what in uh, in Outbound Flight, especially, but also mm-hmm. how they talk about him with uh, choices of one allegiance and he kind of wants to protect the galaxy, really. Yeah, like that's. But to me, like when I read this book, I understood that. But I also kind of saw this as being the only time we really see Thrawn. Thrawn's fully tested. Thrawn is like going all out. Um, he's like. Sure, in the outbound flight, he's got conflict, and in other times, he's got conflict. But at this point, it's like he needs to be perfect. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he's he's not preparing something. Like he's on the losing end. He's got basically one chance to make it right. So I I kind of and this is definitely head cam, but I do kind of use that to explain why he's a bit more intense. Why he's like because really. If with the Emperor dead, Thrawn has got nothing against the New Republic, um, other than the fact that he thinks the Empire. If, if we're using all of Thrawn's character, he thinks yeah. the Empire is a, a better uh, structure to protect the galaxy. Basically, um, well, he he basically thought whatever the established power is is what I need to work with yeah. to beat the Vong, and I'm going to work with Palpatine to set that up, uh, even yeah. if I think he can go to hell for most of the time. Mm-hmm. But uh, one of the things that one of the reasons that it kind of sticks out to me is that. Uh, even Pellion kind of comments on Vader's murderousness as being uh, out of the norm and not a great yes. thing. Yeah. Uh, and then we kind of see the same... Much more restrained, but still pretty bad. Yeah, like we see Thrawn putting forward those same things a couple times mm-hmm. that are clearly the more pernicious aspects of life in the Imperial fleet and the reasons why they're losing when Thrawn mm-hmm. is supposed to be this reversal of their fortunes. So I think even within that context, it would have been better if he just hadn't killed him. Maybe it's kind of interesting too, because or fire him the, maybe and like, I don't know. Yeah. Even he's the best conscript. version of Thrawn is, is an authoritarian. Though, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, he's usually Thrawn portrayed is... as a, as a compassionate authoritarian, like right. very much full of himself and very much has reasons to be full of himself and expect himself to be listened to. Yeah. But also, uh, more like evil Dumbledore than anything. I'm. Yeah. I, I need to stop bringing out Harry Potter. I'm sorry, everyone. But I think of like, honestly, he's almost like good Palpatine in a way. Like, because because pe- people say that um, Palpatine, like, there's you know the everyone online. Actually, Palpatine is just making these Death Stars to fight the Yu Jean Vong. When really, that's like there's no basis for that in the lore. And it's he it's was testing it on Alderaan to fight the Yu Jean Vong. <laughs> right. Um, and like that's contradicted by the lore, and there's not really any. Um, it, it's addressed a few times. Palpatine was just evil, it, like in a way. Thrawn is almost like he, perhaps Thrawn's ideal government, galaxy-wide government, looks a lot like the Empire, but for better reasons, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, it probably more fell Empire than Palpatine's Empire, mm-hmm. right? With a Which is equal proportion brutal, of chiss in it. Like, yeah, yeah, and and even even the Empire, the hand. I mean, even the chiss, like. Like yeah, he's definitely Jack, got a lot Jack of the, and, yeah. the shitty. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this more when we get to the swarm war, but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I agree. So the characters kind of work, but there's also some like it. it they're they're it's a, it's a retcon. Theron's new character is a bit of a retcon. It, yeah. it works well enough, though. Yeah, and we've got a couple questions about that from email. So we'll we'll mm-hmm. and I'm sure that there's been some stuff coming up in the chat, and we'll. I'd probably talk about that a bit later, but yeah. uh, we should probably jump back and talk about the acquisition and use of our good friend Jorah Sabaoth. Sabaoth. One thing I like is that, well, I don't like it, but so for those who don't know, when someone's cloned under, I, I guess only with these cloning methods, they pronounce their name differently. So Joris becomes Jorus, and Luke becomes Luke. Um, Three that's kind of le- just from elsewhere. <laughs> it's just an accent that they pick up in those Sparty cylinders. Maybe it's because Sparty is kind of like a weird word. Yeah, but it it does fit in. It's basically playing off the original. Uh, and I did a video about this. Uh, the original ideas of the Clone Wars as being a war between mm-hmm. the clones and yeah. the Republic, and there's some stuff that kind of we'll get more of that goes later into that. But yeah, without getting too deep in there, it's we get more of that 
uh, in later books because they do talk a little bit, like they make direct references. Yeah. But, uh, like the cloners, and I remember the horror of the cloners. That's one quote, yeah. right? And he's, yeah. they're, Zed is basically trying to explain why that thing would have happened, why that war would have mm-hmm. happened. Yeah. Uh, which he shouldn't have done. <laughs> which he shouldn't have done, but it was also sort of in it's line with what everyone yeah. thought at the time. And yes, no one thought <laughs> it would be. But it'd be the same as if George Lucas did make another sequel trilogy and Mm -hmm. or even if the sequel trilogy we have now was kept in the Legends timeline and clearly everything's different. It's like, well, they should have known not to do the Yuuzhan Vong War because this is in the middle of the Yuuzhan Vong War. It's like, no, that's not their (laughs) fault. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, So I guess guess it's just like because it's not actually their name that changes. It's how they pronounce it, because like when uh, after... They meet Sabaoth for the first time. Thrawn to Pelion's basically like, did you hear how he said his name? He said Jorus with the telltale, like, I forget exactly what he says. But then later this on... This clone is um, from Georgia. The original clearly <laughs> was not. <laughs> did you hear that twang? <laughs> Learn your linguistics. <laughs> the real Joris Sabaoth would never have said y'all. <laughs> Come back, y'all. Come back now, y'all. Y- 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 <laughs> Oh man, I slaughtered that. But then uh, later on, when Wedge is talking about Sabaoth, he also says Joru rather than Joris. So, mm-hmm. like, even though it's like there's rumored reappearance of Jedi Master Jorus Sabaoth, but whatever, it's not worth looking too deep into it. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so this clone of Joris was. And Thrawn not... knows the original Joris, too. Yeah, he murdered the original okay. Joris, as yeah. we find out. But. Uh, yeah. Original Joris almost killed him, so he knew that the even the original was pretty fe- feisty. Yeah, and there's the five day trip between Merkir and Wayland right before here, which is, they're like right next to each other. Yeah, so, there's a lot of that that doesn't quite work. Also, it talks about at one point Star Destroy is moving at like cruising speed. It would take a, a, a day, and I'm like, what? But yeah, yeah, and like all all the stuff with like striking deep into the heart of the New Republic, going for like the mm. the Sluicy. <laughs> areas and it's like empire way up here yeah slew event way over here yeah but uh way she goes yeah but uh the he already has the i always want to call them the zamari vornskers but oh uh, yeah he had, he has the zamari so he can block the force goes to the goes to wayland with the information he got from over sky uh, to mm-hmm. get Mount Tantus because he wants the cloning technology, which we don't know yet. He wants the cloaking technology as well, which we do know. Yeah. And he wants to acquire the services of Joris. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a previous know- garden guardian of Mount yeah, Tantus. Yeah, does he know it's it's Joris there? Is there like do we know whether he knew who was actually? I think he does. He think- okay, he must. Because um, it's either that or the previous guardian of the mountain was also force sensitive, and that's who Thrawn wanted. But well, Thrawn was yeah. like clearly knowing he needed the Azamari going here, yeah. and, and he, he seems the to know. Joris too is he relies heavily on the battle meditation, and we know from the outbound flight because all the Jedi on the outbound flight basically have like a ship wide battle meditation. So he would have known that Jorus would have been capable of doing that, and he relies heavily on that throughout. Um. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Like, do we even know the story of how Sabaoth was cloned? No, no. Uh, it's all kind one. of left Mercury until okay. uh, until we get there. Okay, so they're saying the chat that he didn't know it was Jor specifically, but uh, that's probably correct. I yeah, I, I don't. That I don't think it's like super Star Wars with any of that. Seventy four yeah. matched it on the back page. It's. He just he wanted to go to the Dark Jedi discount store and got who he could. We got, we got to talk about that, by the way. Uh, the Dark Jedi discount store. Palpatine took blood samples from everyone on the outbound flight. Evan says. Interesting. Okay. No, so I guess that's. We know how he could be cloned. We don't really know what yeah, the process we don't know. was for how he ended up being cloned. Like who actually did it? Because uh, I don't think it was Palpatine. There How also does even... seem to be some, yeah. or it, it was, it was probably Palpatine, but we don't know it was Palpatine. I don't think it's ever specifically covered, but hmm. either way, 
Um, um, he convinces think- Joris to... Sorry, go ahead. To say that, let's get your point first because mine's going to be, I think, probably a longer thing. Longer I was just, session. I was just going to keep going with the. Oh, I just want to talk about so. the Dark Jedi thing because Sith don't really exist in this book. Yeah, well, everyone's the, a Dark Jedi. The plan that Zan originally had was that the Sith were the Nogri, right? Yeah, and which that Darth Vader lame. was the Lord of the Sith, and that's where that title came from. Which is, so, I'm, I'm so, so glad, glad that they didn't, didn't do that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like thank well, God. Lord, yeah, it's basically like Darth Vader, Lord of the Nogri. Like, I'm pretty sure that's pretty low on like his level of achievements. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's got some blizzards that follow him. <laughs> yeah, it's. I uh, the... there's a couple of times where like Zahn is like, because eh. like he also wanted Obi Wan as as didn't he also want Obi Wan to be the bad guy like instead of Sabayoth like clone Obi Wan. It wouldn't surprise me because we do get Luke and Mara, so mm-hmm. I, that that tracks. But uh, yeah, wait, there's a Mara. I think I thought there was. I might be getting that. Might be a cross current riptide. That thing. might be like a three. That oh might, no, sorry. Like I think I'm just thinking loop. of how uh, Luke kills Joris and Mara kills Luke. So she gets to yeah. get off on her I need to murder Luke Skywalker thing. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, uh, I guess we can stop the podcast there because I just literally ended the series, right? Oh, well, she goes. All right. So uh, we'll be back talking about well, Tatooine to Ghost. Guy? We don't know what happens to him. Oh. So. No, you already mentioned that Rook stabs him. So. No, I didn't. Sure. You did. You said Thrawn dies. You ruined it. Yeah, I did. You're right. Well, let's just let's just I'll scrub this out later. Okay. Let's continue. All right. So we're really not sure where it's going to go from here, but I yeah. do think that uh, that Mar is involved in some way. But <laughs> um, but yeah, what do you think about this like uh, Dark Jedi thing? Are you? I mean, it's kind of because Dark Jedi is something that like as Star Wars has went on, it's like almost totally abandoned. But like it was a pretty common Dark Jedi were pretty prominent in the old EU. Uh, no, it. I think it stays pretty consistent because we get, yeah, we get like the Dark Acolytes during the Clone Wars. uh, And I guess it's like Dark Jedi used to be like almost like a category. It's hard to explain. Like, well, we have before Rusan, there's like the all the Sith, every Sith war that always happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then you get earlier, there's like uh, the proto Sith kind of situations. Uh, But then after that, when Rule of Two happens, they're just usually referenced as Dark Jedi because they're not part of the Sith Order and the Sith aren't really taking applications very much. Yeah. Uh, But But it's it's almost like Dark Jedi is like its own thing. Like Dark Jedi is almost held up to be like its own category of force user. You know what I mean? Yeah, it it kind of is, though, because when they're not specifically in Doctor, or they're not specifically learning Sith ways, like just being a Dark Jedi doesn't make you a Sith. And that's kind of like the Dark Acolytes aren't Sith. Uh, well, yeah. some of them are sort of Sithy, it's just Sith adjacent. Like mm-hmm. Ventress is probably more Sith adjacent than like Sora Balk is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even after Endor, you get uh, most of the Inquisitors are dead, but you get like any residual Inquisitors would probably be Dark Jedi. That's kind of like what happens with Jarek's people. But then you get like uh, the Empire, re- uh, yeah, the, Empire the, the Shadow Academy stuff. Yeah. Uh, you get a fair. But then you also have like, like the, you have like the one Sith too, and like you have the, the true uh, Sith, the one Sith, the, the lost Sith tribe one. of the Sith. The uh, <laughs> you have Lomi and uh, other Lomi. Were were they from the tribe? I forget where Lomi Plo. No, I f- I thought they were. No, they Jedi. were from Shadow Academy, right? Uh, yeah, isn't Lomi Plo? I thought she was. I thought she gets she's from somewhere. like the Swarm War. She come. That's where she comes up most. But she was on uh, the mission to Mercure. Oh and yeah, they were said right. like her yeah, and yeah. I can never that's remember right. the other one's name. But they were sent to sort of do the same thing, and they were working with them. Yeah, uh, Pelk. Thank you. But Pelk, yeah. that that sounds right. But yeah. there, there's little sects of dark Jedi that come up all the time, and like the idea of. Like Yoda's dark Jedi encounter, you have clone mm-hmm. Joris. Uh, mm-hmm. they, it, I think it it's fairly consistent through everything. Yoda's dark Jedi one is weird too. 
Um, because they got the bit fashy dark Jedi, but there's been like three different bit fashy dark Jedi and two font by Yoda species because there's the, the bit fashy dark Jedi, um, who we get references to, especially in this and in, um, air with, uh, Cardass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but then there's also a bit fashy dark Jedi who's fought not by Yoda, but by Minch or whatever, like the other Yoda like yeah. creature is, which is really weird that there's two bit fashy dark Jedi and they're both on Dagobah. Uh, and they're both like associated with the Dagobah cave, but they're completely separate. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's really weird. And then there was the one earlier that Oteg killed. Yeah. And then Master Vandar. Like the bit fashy dark Jedi that Yoda killed, we know like nothing about. I don't even think it's got a Wikipedia page. I think he does. I don't think so. There's one bit of fashy... them does. I At least Googled one of them it. does. There's, there's bit fashy dark Jedi leader. That's the one that um, that's the one Minch kills in the comics. Then there's unidentified bit fashy dark Jedi. Uh, that's the one from uh, Star Wars Tales. And then there's not the actual one, like the 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 biggest one, um, which is kind of weird. Oh, I just found when I Googled that. Snoke is the bit fashy dark Jedi Minch found fought at the dark cave. Snoke? <laughs> that was in uh, someone's Reddit post on Star Wars speculation. Okay, so I, apparently I need to clarify the Vandar and Oteg thing was a joke. Mm. I am... <laughs> Oh uh, boy. Um but people don't know they're Jedi masters, I guess. I don't like Vandar. He's like I actually did a a model of him once for uh a Kotor era mod for Empire War. Mm -hmm. So I have I have a special place in my heart for Master Vandar. Yeah, fair enough. I liked I liked if he went dark side you could kill well he died in the battle. Yeah. I I'm gonna be honest, I enjoyed killing every Jedi Master in Kotor too. <laughs> they were all pretty They're neat. awful. Except for Zezkaiel. Yeah. I think I remember liking Zezkaiel, but I haven't played it in a while, so I may be yeah. uh I may be misremembering him. But the guy yeah. hiding on in the estate on Dantooine, was that Vrook? I think that's where Vrook was, but he was just awful. I don't remember to be honest, but uh, yeah. So uh, Thrawn is able to coerce uh, Sabiath into cooperating with him, partially through removal of powers and partially by promising uh, mm. to give him Luke and Leia as students because he's looking and, to dominate and them um, babies and them like babies. Twins? <laughs> <laughs> That's just amazing. <laughs> he even says that he's it's like Jedi twins. And he breathe deeply it's like ugh, I like this guy <laughs> <laughs> breathing intensify <laughs> but uh so that that's what he thinks is true power thrawn can have his toys and he's willing to cooperate as long as he eventually gets to to play with his uh his little jedi babies he's mostly concerned with Leia and the jedi babies uh thrawn is mostly planning that he's gonna like kill off Luke. Mm -hmm. But maybe he'll give him to, to Sabioth, maybe he won't, but yeah. Um what do you think of the uh Islamari thing pushing away the force? Uh, I I think it's interesting and I think we get enough of it in other places in Star Wars with like the uh, the Yuzon Vong being outside of the Force and uh, how midi-chlorians end up working that... Like, within the midi-chlorian framework, it makes sense as well. Yeah. Uh, it, as, it, like, it's just, just a biological thing. It would never happen in, like, the modern Star Wars canon. Probably. Well... it's like I don't know, because it's like... The Force is supposed to be this thing that, like... You know, like, think about how Yoda describes the Force in, like, Empire. Yeah. I just... I don't know if you can fit, like... Who would who would win a power that permeates everything in the entire universe? Some small scaly boys, like <laughs> yeah. With uh, with a lot more modern stuff, it tends to be 
uh, any disconnect from the, the force, force is usually psychological and, yeah, or exactly. like PTSD, like um, uh, cow and stuff. But mm-hmm. there's an interesting. Um, I mean, one of my plays does so much really well, which is why this book I don't think will beat it. But um, or I don't think I don't know if any book will beat it. Um, but it talks about like how i did a video on this it talks about like how the huts for example they or not not necessarily the huts but lots of species develop a sort of uh like like they evolve and their midi chlorines change basically so Mm -hmm. species that are under that are preyed upon by beings that use the force or that you know the midi chlorines will adapt i guess um so so there'd be there's basically like three or four forces and which force you're using (laughs) depends on what you're doing (laughs) yeah well, there always is kind of like the discussion of like the cosmic force, the living force, but mm. uh, one thing I guess we kind of got up to the capture of Luke again, uh, where Sabiath mm. was like calling out to him and to kill him, uh, yeah. because every attempt up till then, that's like Thrawn had been sending out no restrike strike teams, <laughs> just, just, just doing failing. terrible job, yeah. But uh, one of the things that happens with the interdictors also that the Interdictor is described not necessarily as a gravity well, but as a gravity beam. Oh, was, really? Uh, really? I don't think it's that. ever really described in a similar no. way, but it's specifically like a directed gravity beam almost, where they're picking the area that we want to use it on. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... But I forgot about that. The Interdictor yeah. was now rotating in the wrong direction. It's gravity beam sweeping across Luke's previous course instead of tracking. Yeah, because I was kind of wondering. That makes sense. I guess I didn't really pick up on that because I was wondering how the direction of the Interdictor should matter because presumably um, it would just be. I guess it's. A, I guess it's a cone because I've, I always kind of thought mm-hmm. of Interdictors being like a like a circle around the entire yeah. ship. You know, the right, reinforcement prevention radius in Empire of War. Yeah, maybe it's like a cone. I guess. Yeah, I think that's what Zahn was going for. And I, I think th- later things have kind of made it yeah, more of a like... It kind yeah. of varies. Yeah, But there's only like three in the galaxy, as we learned from X-Wing, so yeah. it's hard to really know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But um, yeah, I guess the story people are saying goes with Cone. See, I didn't even pick up on that because I was just like, my assumptions, I was just like... Mm-hmm. Oh, one thing I wanted to uh, to mention, I just randomly thought about this. It's interesting how these books change with uh, time. In this book, people have like a communicator on them usually. Like Han's got his, uh, like just this thing on him, like his, his um, pager. Com link on him. It's basically like a pager. Later on, like as cell phones rose to prominence in the real world, if you read like uh, New, not New Jedi, or if you read like Fate of the Jedi or Legacy of the Force, they always have their data pads, which are essentially cell phones. They've got like games and stuff on one. them. Um, yeah, I got one too. So it's just it's just kind of funny. Oh, I get it. Your name. It's just kind of funny how like uh, there's just so much disappointment in your voice when you said that. <laughs> yeah. It's just interesting how like th- people are using cell phones in real life. We'll give the characters cell phones. People yeah. are using pagers. They got pagers. <laughs> there was one point in uh, Fate of the Jedi where I think Luke was asking or Ben was asking Vistera for her WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. He was asking her for her Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's one point literally where like Ben is waiting like in a cupboard or whatever. He's hiding from something and he loads games on his uh on his on his, his data pad. <laughs> yeah. It's like I've got my hollow games. Luke probably would have liked that when he was just sitting in, in space <laughs> after this. Damn, I'm so bored. Yeah. Yeah, that's like Luke like willingly leaves the Falcon and fly back to Coruscant. Well, yeah, fly back to Coruscant on his X-wing. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? Why would you ever? Well, he goes, he does uh, trances for most of his traveling. So uh, trancing, but I'd rather still go to a trance on a bed. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, that would be it's, if he was on the Millennium Falcon. He would have been expected to stay awake the whole yeah, time. Sure. Like, okay, well, Han and Lando, this has been fun. But fun. <laughs> Han's like, hey, come on, check out this YouTube video, and Luke's like. It's 10 minutes long. He goes over there. He's like, oh, my God. See you guys later. <laughs> Looks at his Jedi trance, wakes up with a bunch of space sticks on his face, like like marked, like in marker. <laughs> then he, he does abandon R2 for a while because R2 doesn't shut down, but. 
Yeah. But he, he um, gets picked up by Card because Mara tells him where to go. Yeah. So we get her force affinity a little bit. We also get a weird part early on when they put him in the shed. And I guess I kind of figured it out later, but she's like, it would even be believable that someone who had never handled a lightsaber could kill Luke. And I was like, what? What do you mean never handled a lightsaber? Like, But then I was like, oh, she's just kind of thinking um, from an outsider's perspective. Yeah. She hasn't seen the cover of Choices of One <laughs> yet. I think that's Choices of One. Yeah. Yeah, where she's in front of the Star Destroyer. Yeah, holding her. Yeah. <laughs> very Super. clearly holding her lightsaber. <laughs> Super goofy image, but... Um, but then, yeah, like, like later when she actually uses the lightsaber, she's perfectly good with it. Yeah. Um, the, she's very... She's just like sitting there while he's knocked out too. And you're, yeah. you're not sure how long she's been sitting there, but uh, well, I guess he ends up, Luke gets picked up by card cards. Like we're going to decide what we're going to do with you. Uh, yeah. We might hand you over to the empire. Maybe we won't. Yeah. Uh, Mara probably wants to kill you. So be careful for him. But <laughs> while he's doing that, he's got the, his Almari around. So Luke can't sense it. And someone yeah. just walks up behind him and smacks him with a candlestick <laughs> is what I pictured. But he wakes up. He's like, oh, they're not going to expect how fast I heal. <laughs> it's like three days later already. <laughs> I, I love Card, right though. Card's like the best oh. character. Card is great, except for that picture where it's, is it Michael Stackpole, Timothy Zen, and yeah. Shannon McRandall as yeah. Talon, Corin, and <laughs> yeah, Mara? Mara. Like, yeah. Shannon <laughs> as Mara is like what everyone all like, that's her. Uh, so yeah. that works. Uh, yeah. Zahn actually does work as card, but then you get uh, Michael Stackpole as Corin. <laughs> it's like, no. Like, this isn't a dude that's force running and force jumping. <laughs> yeah. Man, he's going to listen to this podcast. He's going to be so fucking pissed. <laughs> it's not an insult. He just doesn't look like Corin. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, but... Oh, I really like the, I really like their base on. Also, if you uh, have you ever listened to the audiobooks uh, for these, no. Yeah, you should because th- well, they're really good. But um, they got like full music, full sound effects. Um, Mark Thompson's uh, all like his voices are all really good. He, like his Han land perfect. Um, his Han is good. His Luke is whiny but good his mara is just like she's just totally nasty the whole time uh and his talent card is just like perfect it's very like it's like mm. accented but i don't know what accent it is supposed to be uh but he's like very smooth talking um it's almost like italian maybe i don't know but it's really i can good. see that yeah it so if i wanted to listen to that is there any like service i could use to, to download could listen to on audible but what if I wanted to type something in when I was doing my checkout? Is there anything that I could type we in? We do need to get out? an audible for the for us. Do you have one? I do not. I do not. I don't. Well, know. if you you can, if you do want to listen to a free audiobook, I, I wasn't planning on promoting my own thing, but you can do audibletrial.com slash my name Eckhart's Ladder and you get a free a free book. Um, someone was asking too because I, I I love the audiobooks. Like I, you know, I, I don't get that much time to read. Um. So, like, but I do get, I do drive around a lot. Like, sometimes when Gus falls asleep or whatever, like, if, if he's being cranky, I'll just take him for a drive and he falls asleep. Um, and a lot of the Star Wars books, I've talked about this before, but a lot of them are really heavily abridged. Um, but these books are there in their entirety. Um, there's older versions where I think Anthony Daniels does the, uh, the narration. But the, I highly recommend the, the 20th anniversary ones. They're, they're, they're phenomenal. And you, yeah, you can get free one or some of the Star Wars books are okay. Some of them are really, really good. Um, just look for unabridged, really. Hmm. Yeah, the ones that are like an hour and a half, generally not as great. Well, some are legitimately two hours and 45 minutes. Like the X-Wing books are that long. And I mean, it's fun. Like for it works for New Jedi Order, actually, um, because there's 19 of them. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. come on. Well, when our podcasts sometimes run longer than the audiobook, that's... I wouldn't say, yeah, like they frequently do, but um, you should listen to, uh, if you have time, you should listen for uh, Dark Force Rising, Corey. I'm curious mm-hmm. what you think. Do you think you would have time? Uh, it's like 14, well, 
Yeah, I mean, unless you do a lot of driving, it's pretty hard. But yeah, and like you can, everyone can see where I basically travel from there to here. I yeah. move my camera, which people yeah. can't see on the stream. But uh, for anyone who's watching this after the fact, I move about that five feet in my day, <laughs> and occasionally I go out the door to my kitchen. Uh, yeah. But other than that, I don't do much traveling. So yeah, all right, you're excused. I'll I'll try to fit it in. But it may not fit. Yeah, it's all right. But yeah, a bridge I saw in the chat. A bridge means basically there's portions of the book taken out. Yeah. Sometimes it works. Sometimes, like star by star, the abridgment is just brutal. They actually cut out where Anakin dies, so it just the rest of the series makes no sense. Well, they like they cut out every scene with Coruscant in it. <laughs> so you actually start off at Mercury. <laughs> it's it's base. It's pretty bad. That's that's surprisingly relevant, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when I started that sentence, I didn't realize how relevant it would be. Yeah. But um, uh, there was actually a mention of Zygerian slavers, which I, for some reason, always thought came up with uh, the Clone Wars. But mm -hmm. it, it was referenced here, so that was just a me thing. You're all welcome. Hmm. Very good. Do In this book, do... Because Warnskers later on, they, they hunt with the Force, right? Yeah. Or Is they that mentioned the in this force. book at all? Yeah, because that's why the Is Is uh, Islamiri have their fence. Is that mentioned in this book at all? Uh, I don't. I don't think it's ever explicitly spelled out. But it's definitely like it. It's definitely something that's being established because of uh, Sturm and Drang's reaction to Luke. And I th I think they mention it as being, uh, them initially being hostile towards Mara, mm -hmm. but like it's oh, definitely yeah. something that's established. I don't think right. it's ever explicitly spelled out yet. Um, I really like their base on Merker. I don't know why. Like I like I I, I like how um Card is sad to leave for no reason other than like he's got a really like dope setup there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and Thrawn even talks about how it's like uh, because of the Zalamari, the Jedi didn't go there because the Jedi didn't go mm -hmm. there. Smugglers would go there, and yeah. that's kind of how he knows about it. Uh, and within the broader expanded universe, that's probably Cardass's work, but Cardass mm -hmm. isn't a person yet. But yeah, yeah. I I really like Mercury as well. Just like he's got like just a cool base too. Like it makes sense. He's got like this hangar. He's got barracks. You know everything that you would. It's like kind of realistic, just like backwater, you know, hole for them to hang out yeah. in. It seems like it's a decent place other than everything wanting to kill you. It's like forest I mean, space woods, Australia. It's not so bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anything else with uh, Sabiath we want to talk about for this? Like, he's definitely going to be more of a factor in yeah, he, he doesn't Dark do much. Rising and Last Command. So uh, the bit of the battle meditation is an interesting idea. Um, yeah, because it, and one thing I was surprised reading this back, like as a YouTuber trying to think of video topics, is it actually straight up says how effective his battle meditation is when he's distracted, when he's because it's like all the metrics, like performance metrics across the ship are up by forty percent, and he's coordinating other task forces, and he's a clone of the actual Jedi Master. So it's just like imagine what Palpatine was doing like on the Death Star. Yeah. And I like how like Pelion, who's like a 50 year old veteran of the Navy, like he's like obviously very proud of the the Empire. He's like personally offended. Like probably the most angry he gets in the whole, the whole book is when um, Thrawn basically says, yeah, you guys were relying on battle meditation. You had no gumption basically. And then once Palpatine died, you guys were trash. Like you guys were recruits, he says. Um, I thought it was an interesting idea. I mean, it, it helps kind of explain away how, like, why did the Imperial fleet just run after the Death Star was destroyed? Why didn't they, you know, fight it out? And kind of like, obviously a bit of a retcon, but I think it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's also pretty much just, I was like, it's, it's not that none of you were ever capable of anything. It's just you were so reliant on that you didn't know it that when it was gone, yeah. you were lost. So exactly. it's not like, actually, you're all trash. It's just... You're all right. decent, but you didn't realize how much you were using this thing. It was a crutch, and now look, it kind of he kind of mentions too, like how the empire was totally they lost 
their will to keep fighting almost like mm. they like they're basically in a slump because they just weren't being effective and um and yeah it's just kind of like it's like the empire is like morale was so low at that point that like once that sort of stimulant was gone it's mm. like yeah you were. yeah withdrawal is a good uh withdrawal analogy for mm. that um, um but yeah, with, with that, that that kind of ties into oh, sorry no go ahead I was just going to say that kind of ties into a lot of the, or it's a, it's as good of a segue as I'm going to get without lampshading it more than I'm doing right now, uh, into how often the original trilogy is kind of referenced uh, and specific yeah. events. Way too much. Which is, yeah. Uh, um, Moss Eisley, like, it's like, oh, this reminds me of that time on Moss Eisley. Or like, it's like nothing has ever happened in their lives between the yeah. original trilogy and now is I think the thing that makes me uh, dislike it as much as, like, we both had our things in mm-hmm. X-Wing that we'd harp on. Yeah. And for you, it was uh, the Corellian odds thing. For me, it was yeah. Akbar swimming puns, uh, yeah. which not quite the same thing as references, but... But I mean, there were also the, like, X-Wing does it too. Like the, for example, they've got, there's always references to Tatooine. Yeah. They've got Biggs' cousin and stuff. Um, but like, yeah, this book... It's it. There's what four different instances I think where someone says I've got a bad feeling of this, about this. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like scenes where it's like, but I will say, I I kind of got like I was thinking about this thing I was listening to it. Um, it it's not so bad as like episode seven. I'm not saying episode seven is a bad movie or anything, but episode seven is basically a remaster. It's 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 a soft remake of A New Hope. I think everyone yeah. knows that. Um, they've like the, JJ has even said like they yeah, wanted to start safe they had to get people then... back in which okay that's that's fine I'm not criticizing that necessarily this doesn't do that because the plot really isn't similar to any Star mm-hmm. Wars movie but what it does do is kind of take those little those little aspects of the movie and kind of takes them as a way to ground it to the rest of the series instead yeah um, like for example the scene where um, Luke is talking about how Mara wants to kill him to Han, that really reminded me of um, a couple of scenes. First, when they're both leaving the Death Star and talking about like, oh, have you ever met a girl like that? But also um, at the end of Return of the Jedi, when, um, or not the end, like the midpoint of Return of the Jedi, when Luke's talking to Leia and he's like, just trust me or whatever. Or like, you know, like I, like, I can't explain it. He's like, I can't explain to Han why she wants to kill me. Yeah. I mean. And I think for what it's doing, uh, a lot of those work, but the yeah. parts that I don't like are the ones where it's like, where they're like outright referencing what happened before. Because uh, mm-hmm. to a certain extent, I forgive it more with uh, with the Thrawn trilogy than with other books because it's like, this is yes. kind of them starting off that universe. It's like, we do need to get people in. But the way mm-hmm. he handles the rest of the universe is so good that it's yes. unnecessary for him to do this stuff, which is kind Agreed. of what makes it stick out. It's kind of like having an essay with like subheadings when the topic sentences mm-hmm. are already there. And doing yeah, a much it's like the job. train, like Tatooine supposed to be a isolated planet. Every time they go to the, every time they go there betrays like Luke's lines in a new hope. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's not as bad as in, um, dark saber. I think when they go back to Hoth and Luke kills that Wampa that attacked him. <laughs> You remember that he he kills that wampa that he cuts off his arm. Yeah, like he cuts off that, that wampa's arm, then he goes back and finishes the job. <laughs> Luke's just not a good person. It's actually, a thing that happens like like that's as that's how bad it gets on some occasions. Yeah, uh, I think that's in Dark Side or, or I can't remember, but either way, like yeah, th- this book like it 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 borrows a lot mostly in how the characters interact with each other too, like. When, she, when Leia says, I'm not a committee, that's like, ugh, I rolled my eyes at that so hard. Like, he doesn't need to do that. Like, especially where he pretty much nails the characters as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Like, if it was a weaker book and yes. that was the only stuff that I felt like was tying it into Star Wars, then, eh. but here it's just everything, pretty it much feels, everything else is done so well. Yeah. It's just those stick out. It's the same kind of issue I have with the. Uh, Deus Ex Thrawn issues where it's like there's so much good around it that mm-hmm. it's unnecessary and then it gets added in and it becomes like it detracts from the overall effect of I'm everything. I'm going to play a bit of devil's advocate though. 
part of the reason why it feels so much like Star Wars is perhaps because all of the expanded universe is basically based off of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I I'm specifically referring to how it feels like the original trilogy when I say that though. I'm oh, not talking okay. about how it fits within uh everything right, else cuz uh the way it does the characters, the way it does the uh the pacing uh everything feels like original trilogy and mm -hmm. i think we were talking about how courtship had so far felt like the most like the original trilogy yeah uh of everything we've read and i think this uh yeah, this the throne trilogy that. edges it out a little bit courtship mm -hmm. is probably in the same range as it but yeah. that's basically what i'm talking about here where uh and i think that's actually something that courtship did better is it kept that feel but it wasn't quite so uh this time when luke was mm. holding his lightsaber as it opened with a snap hiss which was another thing i forgot that happens like 80 times in the books <laughs> yes. uh courtship didn't necessarily rely on that stuff as much and mm. i think it was better for not having done that and i think right. thrawn trilogy could have done that as well and mm. it would have been slightly better but but again because of like there wasn't a Star Wars expanded universe. You gotta like we both. I think. Yeah, I understand like why the he very, did. Very very hard situation yeah. that he yeah. was in. Like I don't think, I don't think even in his best, like, like I don't I don't think best case scenario for Timothy Zahn before this would have seen this book be so successful. Yeah. Like I, I'm not. I, uh, it's kind of the same thing with the Thrawn stuff I was talking about earlier, where it's like, uh, I'm sort of using his future work and like showing it as a way that he's yes. improved. Uh, mm. and like, I, I understand why he did it, but at the same time, I, especially when we're going to be ranking it up against other stuff, yeah. uh, so with that historical perspective, that, we guess. can, like, yeah, we can, we can see why these choices were made and I can understand and accept why those choices were made at the time, but mm -hmm. I'm also, you gotta be reading it myself. It yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm reading it as someone who is already familiar with all this stuff and can judge it mm -hmm. in uh where it and like where it sits now uh yeah. and i'm i'm not necessarily like i'm not saying it takes it makes me not enjoy the book it's just these are the things that i think changed in how he wrote for the better mm -hmm. yeah no i mean if you, you gotta look at the, you gotta look at it fairly you can recognize you can excuse it but if you're being objectively if you're being objective you still gotta um, no, that makes total sense. But it is it is remarkable how different of a villain Timothy Zahn decided to go with. Um, because at the end of the day, Sabayoth is not the ultimate bad guy in this. It is Thrawn. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Thrawn trilogy. It's not the Sabayoth trilogy. Um, and yeah, I, I just I just think like it's it's interesting how, or even like a, a little bit brave because it would have been very easy to do the Empire thing and go with whether literally or not palpatine 2.0 um, well it, it kind of was where palpatine and thrawn were playing analogous roles and sabayoth was vader where he's trying to lure luke over to the dark side and you get the yeah. exact same uh, but, but thrawn is fundamentally different than palpatine. yeah but it's the same sort of he's going for the same sort of uh power dynamic of here's the powerful wizard guy who controls everything uh or powerful wizard guy who's trying to bring over luke to be another dark powerful wizard and then mm -hmm. you have the other guy who's in charge of everything who's in this case not a powerful wizard but palpatine's powerful wizardness didn't really play as much into yeah, uh, the original fair. trilogy but that, that is fair um but the original trilogy also never really gives us like like it, it would have been easy to structure it in the same way too because the original trilogy doesn't mm -hmm. give us the imperial perspective yeah, um, like I'm not saying it's the exact thing. No, it's just no, there. It's still I, trying I, I to recreate saying. some of those power dynamics mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I at the core of it. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense to me. Um, but it could have it could have been so much worse. Um, even Dark Empire, you know, Dark Empire relies on the same bad guy. Mm -hmm. but it's a it's the structure of that story is like in that that relies on the bad guy and. It also does returns things to the um, rebels versus empire thing because the New Republic, basically the rebels, in that book uh, they even call themselves the rebellion. But um, that book like fundamentally, um, or sorry, that comic like is also fundamentally different than the like original yeah. show, just how it's structured. Although there is they, he does meet like a Yoda like character and stuff, but um, 
Yeah. Um. So I guess uh, that kind of just leaves us with Leia's time with the Wookiees, hmm. Luke's escape, and hmm. Lewis Van. Let's start Slewy with the Van. Wookiees. Um, I love how Kashyyyk is portrayed in this. It's so cool. Like it's so fantastic and interesting, and nothing I don't think has ever done it justice. Yeah. Like it describes like the the tallest trees are like a kilometer taller than like the regular trees you know like like it's like it's not just like the Kashyyyk and revenge of the sith is the most disappointing shit of all time it's like they're fighting on like a hill next to the water like Kashyyyk's supposed to be like you know it's 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 it's, it's basically a high it's like a it's like a fantasy city you know what i mean like mm-hmm. like the wookies have like these basic like they have entire streets on like branches and stuff and they have um like it's just it's just crazy all like what he sets up and he does such a cool job Kodor does an okay job but kashik is basically like yeah someone ex- daigo said exactly what i was about to say it's tree coruscant it's got like the undercity that probably no one's ever been to the very bottom except it's the shadowlands and like it's yeah. like basically say shit gets more evil as you go down i think kotor did about the Best it could be done relative to the technological limitations of making a video game at that point, because uh, it's it's small areas, but the small areas we got are basically what you'd expect from it. That's uh, true. But let's not sleep on the fact that Leia is going here for protection, and the yes. first thing she wants to do is shoot a Wookie. <laughs> Why does she want to? Sh- oh, Sal Poro when he's wrestling with yeah Chewie. Yeah, <laughs> let's let's not make let's not make a scene. Let's not make a scene. Oh. Cr- it's like it doesn't. It just seems like they're hugging too, and she's like, "I'm gonna execute this mother." <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leia, what are you yeah. doing? Leia has a problem. I think uh, you you can say it's like a little bit of, and it's not misogyny, but it's just like all the women in Star Wars at this point are very emotional. Like Leia cries a lot. Um, like. You never have like Luke. If Luke saw Salporo die, it is Salporo who dies later on, isn't it? Uh, is it? Salporin, Salporin, Salporin. Yeah. Is, is it him that dies later on? Yeah, like, yeah. Like when Leia sees that, she like starts crying. Like you know, Luke never would have started crying. Uh, um, I, I don't think I don't maybe, they, maybe I'm reading too much into it. That might be more of a, a, a men problem thing than either. A women. Problem. I think it's just like yeah. I just think it's like. Not necessarily like Leia didn't cry when Alderaan got blown up. You know, she is she is pregnant though. Yeah. Um. Uh. But yeah, I don't know. She's like she's very. I didn't love Leia in this book to be honest, but. Yeah, she's. It's mostly just uh, protect the Leia. Mm-hmm. It is most of her involvement. The precious and... protect the precious womb it gets basically. a bit better with uh yeah. the net with dark force rising which is when they spend a bit more time on uh yeah. or do they go to, i think they do go to honiger yeah in dark in force next, rising yeah. yeah but uh oh, i love the nogri too i think they're super cool <laughs> i love the lady vader yeah <laughs> when Hulk comes they the lady vader and he's just like what the hell <laughs> there's gonna be a lot to unpack with that i think yes mm, probably when we get to uh last command will it's probably when we're gonna speak more in depth about it but uh, at one point um they mentioned that um um it's is it cabarash i forget he's Cabrash, the one that yeah. They, yeah he they uh it's like he had hair over his eyes i'm like where the hell does a nogri get hair from like i think it's just really long eyel or eyebrows yeah maybe just like curtains from his eyebrow. yeah the the Nogri bodyguard like Kabarak becomes one of her first. Yeah, uh, it's Kab- Kabarak. Who's the other one? And um, well, it's uh, Kakmane and Miwa for a Kakmane while. Kakmane and Miwa, yeah. And I think they're my favorite. I think uh, there's one that lasts a really long time, but the rest of them they they're just red shirts in Star I'm Trek. Sure it's like Kakmane and Miwa last for quite a while. Uh, they last for a few books, but their successor there's it might actually be Kabarak that I'm thinking about but one ends up with like three or four partners and mm-hmm. they just keep getting shot 
Um, yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. Uh, the Nogri was one of my favorite things of Bantam because even like, um, even like, I, I guess they do go into NJO and maybe a little bit further, but um, oh, I think Jason kills Cacmane and Miwall like when he fires on the Falcon. Remember that? Like, but uh, yeah, I did like how just like always there's like Nogri with them, like, like it's like you just kind of love them because they're so cool and like they're like they just are so loyal they're, they're like small wookies basically yeah um and they're always like with the kids or often it's like when, whenever i think of them they're like in the gunners of the, the gunners of the falcon for um a lot of it and i remember one of them is killed in like vector prime i think or at least really early in the vong war yes yeah. and that's basically like to show that because the vong aren't to trifle with which is kind of like a uh, isn't that, well, they also like dropped the, the moon on Chewie, so yeah. Isn't that called like the wharf? Like, because wharf is always killed um, to like show like oh, like this like this guy is badass because wharf in Star Trek is like like such a good fighter and everything, and then how he loses every fight. Yeah, but he's watched... supposed to be so he's supposed to be so tough. Yeah, wharf affects someone is uh, is uh, calling it because yeah, wharf's supposed to be a badass. So when someone comes and beats him up. It's basically like proof that like, oh, this person's really badass. It's kind of like they do the same with um, the Nogri in uh, yeah. Vector Prime. Um, I think it's Vector Prime. I, I don't remember the exact book, but early on in the war. Mm-hmm. And of course, the, the Chewy thing, which which was a big deal. Uh, or the, Vegeta. Yeah, Vegeta is another really good example or of that. Yeah. So with Leia, she basically gets there. She sees Anogri like immediately, and then eh, whatever you can stay here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Gets uh, Salporin killed, but yep. not really Which much. Just like Chewie's best friend too. That. Yeah. In that attack, they capture Kabrak, and yeah. really anything else that happens with that plot, we're probably going to talk about more with yeah. DFR and uh, Ooh, you got TLC. Now. Or initialisms here on TT with <laughs> C and J. <laughs> very nice. That sounds um, very clean and official. Um, <laughs> but yeah, then the, the Nogri are cool. Um, they've got like it's it's pretty cool. How how do you do you think that their their history gets a little messed up with the timelines because yeah. it's supposed to be a re- but like with the ships and stuff, but it's not a big deal. It it honestly it uh. It's pre Clone it, Wars that it ends up working being, out too, but yeah, that's more of a timeline. The years being messed up issue than yes, but not a big deal. Um, we haven't really even gotten much of Rook this uh, this book. Like, no. I guess one of the first scenes we uh, we we have Rook uh, kind of scaring <laughs> Pelion, which is pretty funny. It's basically um, uh, Melvar and Zinge, but Rook and <laughs> yeah. Pelion, basically, yeah. Can you imagine if Zin or sorry if uh, Thrawn was completely normal, like, exact same as he was now, but just really fat? <laughs> like, like I wish I got to hear the word girth more in the Thrawn trilogy. Is what I'm saying. As Luke's lightsaber ignited with a snap hiss, he looks sardonically down at Thrawn's girth. <laughs> <I've> got- <laughs> sardonically at his girth. That's interesting. I- I've actually been collecting a whole list of words that uh, there's a- there's like probably six words that Zahn says all the time. Some of them don't pop up as much in this book, but I just remember. Uh, let me just... I, I, had a, I had a document with this. Okay. Admonished. Lots of people are admonished. And um, get ha- looked at admonishingly. <laughs> yes. Han gives a lot of injured looks, and other people give injured looks as well. Um, Luke soothes R2, and lots of characters say things with uh lots of characters soothe other characters sardonically it's there it says a lot um and the other is warbled but we didn't we don't really get that in this book i think warbled might be a later timothy zahn thing yeah it, i think it depends on the proportion of r2 we get yeah i'm just gonna google timothy zahn sardonically and see what comes up <laughs> timothy zahn is not worth anyone noticed how often timothy zahn has his characters swear under their breath that's true um 
This is just comments on this Reddit on this Reddit post from five years ago. I love how every other line is said sardonically. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, grimace. Oh, there's lots of grimaces. Um, and funnily enough, he's actually referencing the McDonald's mascot <laughs> character. Which is really surprising. <laughs> he was part of Card Smuggler Organization. Oh, here's one. The familiar snap hiss of a lightsaber. <laughs> lip twisted um yeah there's like uh, I, i'm gonna open my ebook and see how many times it, the word sardonically appears just one second okay we're, we're just playfully making fun of uh zon here because everyone's got their own writing style so but uh shall we move on uh yeah i think we've just got the great escape and Lewis van left okay do you, oh, do you want to talk anymore? Is there anything about Kashyyyk you want to mention? What did you What did you think of the? Because I talked a lot about my thoughts. What about you? Uh, no, I I basically just agreed with what you said and think okay. Kotor did it well. I don't have much else to add other than what you said there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like the Wookies are pretty cool. Oh, the audio. What's the name of the uh, like the Wookie with the lisp? Basically, um, uh, Ruru? raw is it raw rock or something? Um, oh man, the uh. The audiobook is almost unlistable because of how, uh, how how the narrator does him. He growls for half of it. And it's just, mm. uh, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty special. Uh, um, is there anything you want to say about uh, Han and Lando's meeting with Card and Luke's time with Card before? Like, kind of talked about the Izalmari and Dermot Strang stuff yeah. with Luke. Um, and we've we've talked a little bit about Mara's history. But that comes yeah. out a bit more in the escape. Uh, I do like, um, I do like at the end how, like, despite all of his like scheming and stuff, Car just like, yeah, like, what am I gonna do? <laughs> like, like when uh, it's discovered when Han and them rescue uh, Luke, and Luke's like, so have you made up your decision? He's like, what am I gonna do? He screwed. Um, Luke's suggestion of like, just put me back. <laughs> yeah, I'll just I'll just sleep. Just like you let me back in. <laughs> If you want to abandon me in the middle of space, act like this never happened. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yes, like exactly. I will do says. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I felt bad for cars. Like, you, yeah, you didn't no, want any of he's, this. He's he's a, like fundamentally a, a good uh, a good person. Um, and yeah, he like he's like a he, he's like the. I don't know if he'd be like. I'm trying to put him on like the the alignment chart. He's like a he's a good, I think. Like at first he's like a like a neutral. I think he's chaotic he, good. You think so? I th- or, yeah, I, I think that's right. I think yeah. Because the the smuggling is 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 chaos. Um but he doesn't he specifically says he doesn't do slavery, he doesn't do um you know, stuff like that. So he might actually be lawful neutral. Because I think until book three, maybe. I, I yeah, think like he does have his code end. that he stands up to, so I want to say lawful, but lawful good I, doesn't really work with... Well, lawful good does work with the smuggler stuff because everything he does with smuggling is making oh, him help. I, oh, you meant public. lawful good. Okay, I, th- I just thought you meant lawful neutral. Well, I, I, I did he, say I lawful a neutral at first, be, but... I don't know if a smuggler can be lawful, though. Well, lawful doesn't just mean like you follow the laws yeah, as no, written. Because no. if you're like living you're within right. the imperial law, you're right. you are... Yeah, you're right. He's got a very good... He's got a very... You're right. He's got a very strong... Um, so and he right. wants think... to do the right thing. So he's doing the smuggling, but he's trying to do it according to a code of laws that he has set up himself. So you yeah. could say he started off uh, lawful, evil, even... Maybe if you, yeah. I wouldn't even say that. Maybe lawful neutral. He's probably presented as lawful evil because for a bit in this book, anyways. I mean, he replaces Java, so like you assume yeah. he's going to be. And he, it's ultimately a criminal syndicate um, because what he's doing is a crime, but it's not like you know, it's not a. He's smuggling, like he's yeah. Come on, and he's doing a lot of smuggling in the Empire as well, especially yeah. Yes, which when you're disobeying the Imperial laws. Yeah. And there's also the fact that smuggling is really redundant in the New Republic because they're not charging tariffs anyway. Yeah. Uh it's just like no one believes like how good of a how good of a situation it is. It's just like, you know. Uh I 
but he's not evil. I I, I can't. I don't. Yeah, Card's not evil. We especially in the last book. And does, does anything really come out of Han and Lando's trip other than establishing their relationship with Card? Because I don't think they they don't they get Ghent. Well, the well they help. They help Luke escape. I guess. Sort of. They distract Card enough that. Well, no, I mean at the end when like he's arrested yeah. by no, I, sorry, I, I mean just with their actual visit in the compound. Oh, not their actual the... visit. Um, yeah. I guess the best thing would be like, or the most significant thing is like they get confirmation that, that there's a grand admiral. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so other than that, uh, like we get more out of their relationship with Card with the uh, uh, with Katana Fleet. That's kind of what they're setting yeah. up for. So I don't know. If there's much we. Yeah, they mostly learn about. It's mostly like yeah, we mostly learn about um Card and we we learn that he learns that there's a grand admiral but they don't get a name and yeah. Uh so yeah, I guess that just gets us to the escape then. Luke uses his hand to power a door which cool. I thought was fun. And just uh, like it, it really the it makes you think like how crazy power generation is in the Star Wars universe. You probably never need to change that battery out. <laughs> yeah, so many crystals everywhere. This book does one of those things. It, uh, some other Star Wars books do this too, where like there's a problem and like the characters like oh. use real world or sorry, like Star Wars problem solving to figure it out. Like, well, we can't bypass the motivator, so we'll have to go through this. And then, you know, it's like I'm trying to think of another example in the book. Um the best one, pro- oh, like when Luke's fixing his X-wing, for example, and like him and Art, like basically the chapter is just him and R two, like trying to figure out how to fix it. It's like I just oh, need a thousand kilometers of wire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we gotta have that lying around. Yeah. Um, and then Luke goes to sleep and he's like, "Good luck." I doesn't even have hands, like <laughs> spooling like ten kilometers of wire. You know, if a dumb labor droid could do it, can't you do it, R two? Yeah. Um. But yeah, and I guess another example would be when like Lando and Han are just like it's just like two like handymen, like Star Wars handymen figuring shit out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I like those scenes. They're fun. Yeah. Uh, is there even much to like? We get a. I guess we can talk about Luke and Mara's relationship a little bit more. We uh, already talked about it a lot earlier, and mm-hmm. kind of like Mara's upset about uh, him. I guess he's more. She's more than upset about him killing. The, yeah, she was the emperor. emperor's hand. Yeah, and I don't think it's come up yet, but like she has voices in her head telling her she must kill Luke Skywalker. Right. No, I, uh, we didn't get any of that yet. Because yeah, I think that's all when we start getting more of her perspective in. Uh, I think in Dark Force Rising. Yeah. Um, because that's kind of what keeps her so motivated and so hateful of Luke, and then that's mm-hmm. how the the clone situation kind of resolves it. But. Yeah. Uh, it's basically just programming by Palpatine. Yeah. So, uh, but I like they, too when she finds out that she wasn't the uh, only Emperor's hand. Yeah, that's gotta suck. Yeah, because she's like, she basically thinks she's like very special girl. <laughs> yeah. So Luke's inability to fly the skip ray with it, like he he never lets on to his broken hand the whole time with her, mm-hmm. and that's why he can't really do much. Mm-hmm. And like he drops the, he's using like a, a makeshift. Like a sleigh, uh, almost. Sleigh to sleigh. pull yeah. R2 around, and he drops it once or twice, and they're like, this, get a load of this. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this jackass. <laughs> and he ne- he never lets up with that, so. No. He. Um, well, one thing we didn't talk about was uh, Bothans and failure and the whole. Yeah, Manny yeah. Bothans, yeah. failure and the whole sort of uh, internal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I guess that's that's. Philly is such a dick, but like you don't see it as much. He's like very just he's very um like shrouded in this book. Like he's always mm-hmm. pretending to be nice. He's furs rippling politely, <laughs> you know. Uh we get more of his like outright just like assholishness. Yeah. Because the the fallout from Slewis fan ends up yes. being the big thing that shifts. There's there's a power struggle between uh the direct one is between Akbar and Phalia. Failia mm-hmm. kind of wants the supreme commander position, but it's like, but he wants a fa- it like the factions, though. Like, yeah, yeah. And Failia eventually wants to be chief of state, but he thinks that his stepping stone for that is going to be uh, as supreme commander. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So he's cr- trying to undermine Akbar. There's a lot of the military who are like Akbar supporters or mm-hmm. uh, Phalia supporters. And so that struggle plays out a lot more uh, in Dark Force Rising. But we get a lot of the setup for that where like, yeah, we see Borsk being a complete dick. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, we learned too, like how much of this is being manipulated by Thrawn as well. Because uh, mm-hmm. Thrawn is like helping... There's a, there's a scene in the next book, I think, where, like, Thrawn attacks a New Republic convoy and, like, they've got A-wings there protecting them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Thrawn's like, look at this shit. You can tell, like, the New Republic's <laughs> suffering because uh, you can tell the New Republic's suffering with uh, with uh, Akbar not at the helm, basically. I kind of like picturing all Thrawn and Pelion's interactions that way as, like, a robot chicken sketch, how they would have done mm-hmm. it. Just... Yeah. <laughs> arms <laughs> look at this guy like arms waving and shit <laughs> impotent a wings everywhere <laughs> uh, so i the escape in the battle at the city that all happens before yeah because han and lando go from the battle to slew fan but mm-hmm. uh is there really anything else with that battle to talk about i think it's just like shooty shooty slicey mm-hmm. slicey call me falls down so no, chariot. not really. I mean, the the bit with Lando is kind of cool, I guess. Yeah, with Lando and um, uh, Aves. Aves, yeah. Um, that part's good, but yeah. I don't think there's really much to say. Just just read that part. It's 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 fine. Um, the most interesting thing is just Luke doesn't have the, his Force powers. Mm-hmm. It did kind of bother me a little bit that like I wish they kind of did like updates more because like the action is like progressing and Luke's like in the city and I don't know whether he's got his Force powers back. Like I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's kind of supposed to be, mm-hmm. that's the part of it, like, I, are they going to be there? Or are they not? Yeah. So Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I guess we should mention, too, we haven't really talked about Luke's powers, because he is pretty damn powerful in this book. Um, we didn't talk about Bimisari when they get uh, raided by the Nogri. Luke, mm-hmm. like, kills, what, like, ten of them, basically, with, with a, single, a single saber throw. Yeah, he throws the saber, and it's just like... Like, like he's he's powerful and he's very Jedi esque, like because he doesn't want to kill. He even when he does like pretty what I think I would call mundane deceptions, like oh, when he pretends to be Mara, basically. Um yeah. he's like, Is this something a Jedi should really be doing? We get a lot more of that in um the Thrawn duology where Luke basically does like some self reflection and he's like, Yeah, I've been way too uh handsy with the force. I've been doing too many like too much hood rats shit with my friends. Um, and he kind of s- s- like steps back and then like the other stuff just like, it's like, nah, Luke's just going to kill things. But um, yeah, in this, he's very, uh, he's very cognizant of like the role of a Jedi. Cause he's, he's also scared. Like he's, he's worried about becoming Darth Vader or making another Darth Vader. He's scared to train Leia. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a pretty interesting dynamic. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that I do like about Last Jedi, though, is that uh, like yeah. we've already seen the version of Luke that like powers through that, gets mm-hmm. eighty trillion students killed, but he eventually does get the order back. But yeah. that I I do like the fact that we already got that, and then with TLJ, we got the version of Luke that is like he tried that a little bit, was nervous about it, it failed with Ben in the biggest way that it could, yeah. and then he cuts off completely. And, also, yeah, sorry, go ahead. But yeah, we are we don't need to get into TLJ, but... No, but I, th- I think ultimately people's idea of like what Jedi should be is kind of ruined by the prequels where they're shown to be fighting a war, but like the whole point is they shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, because like, like Luke refuses to kill Vader to fight Palpatine in Return of the Jedi. Um, like that is... A Jedi doesn't have to be defenseless, he was like that because he was scared of falling to the dark side. But like, still, you've got to, I think, really self like. Even games like you know, people always talk about the Force Unleashed, but like, being a Jedi is less about you know killing things, and I'd say it's even less about defending the galaxy than being like kind of a force for good. I think. Yeah. Or not being explicitly a force for evil, or making sure your first priority is not becoming a force for evil. Yep. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, that this handles that really well. But I, it, it's 
The Last Jedi is very similar to, in a lot of ways, to the Thrawn duology, but mm-hmm. we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, but yeah, so now uh, Han and Lando are heading to Slewis Fan because uh, mm. they want to get. That's like the closest place they can get repairs or something. Yeah, and Luke decide, as well. Which yeah. is clearly bullshit. But yeah, clearly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but whatever. Uh, but we did get that scene. So they want to Luke. check up on the raids from earlier. Better, but yeah, they're nearby, and then they get to the right place. Yeah. But yeah. whatever, they they end up in the right place. Mm. Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> but we get the scene I was talking about earlier that I really like with Wedge and Arcus or Harkness uh, yeah. or. Um, where like he's just drinking coffee and like yeah. and and or Wedge is drinking tea and he's like, man, I'm actually being kind of a dick here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he's still Wedge. Yeah, he we totally. we're seeing the maturity he gained over the course of the X Wing books before they were written. A little so, bit. Uh, also meant to mention the uh, on that note, there's Han and the general a bit too, but that's just a kind of ties in with print mm. courtship i guess but yeah yeah you're right that it's a nice little uh x-wing short story there <laughs> and we it's kind of used to back up the whole akbar versus Philia uh rivalry because mm. i think i'm gonna Wedge just keep pro our is, is pro yeah. Philia, mm-hmm. or some of the people i run into are but while they're waiting for this routine stuff to happen thrawn jumps into the system slewis fan is going to be our this is the big part of the campaign. All the other operations we're doing is uh, mm-hmm. secondary. And they've yeah. got 51, 54, 51, 51 mole miners. Yeah. And there's, well, yeah, like, and, yeah, 51, I think. And they've got a lot. They want to make off with a few dozen capital ships because yeah. there's just for some, we talked earlier about how the New Republic basically has logistics problems and there's been this attack on the Sluissi sector. Um, so. They've basically they've not decommissioned capital ships, but they're using them to transport cargo. Yeah. Um, and they're basically sitting undefended. Well, not undefended at Sluis Fawn, because Sluis Fawn does have its own defense force. There are like hundreds of ships there, but Thrawn's whole plan is to get in there after sowing the destruction, um, and then basically collect his prizes. Yeah. Like he's got the uh the freighter, which has they've like mocked up to be damaged to kind of yeah. disguise the fact that it's full and they've got uh, cloaks on all of the, uh, on all the mole miners or within the transport rather. Yeah. Uh, it's not every mole miners cloaked, I don't mm-hmm. think, but yeah. uh, that the transport just explodes, sends the mole miners everywhere and all the confusion. Mm-hmm. They start boring into the ships and mm-hmm. it's very, it's going very much in the Imperials favor. Uh, Thrawn telling Pelling like, we don't want to engage too heavily delaying all those orders yeah, uh, and uh, it's going fine until Lando shows up, and it's basically, "Hey, Lando, don't yeah. you still have the coach?" So Lando's been injured. Yeah. Oh, I think I just lost Corey. Just a second. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I lost you for a second. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, the the way the battle is resolved is basically just Lando saying, "Hey, I still I can turn those mm-hmm. on." They just bore straight through the ships. Yeah. They like wreck them, but like it's not quite as bad as it might have been. <laughs> yeah, and Thrawn. I think Thrawn does get a few out. But it seems nowhere like near does, what they don't want. really we don't really see them later. Yeah, so it it's it's not anywhere near what he needs for the campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh no, no. It, well, did he get any out? Because I thought he got at least but a couple. all the mo- yeah, I guess most of the mole all the mole miners would have went off. Well actually he says Well there was one that was like making it to the, the jump point by the time yeah. that, that by they, they got there. But it may I may have just been uh, extrapolating and saying that or thinking that some got out, but nothing significant really gets out. Um, it's interesting too how cloaking in this case is not um, it's it doesn't cloak the ship visually. It just hides the interior from sensors. Um, and that kind of varies depending on. Like like when Thrawn raids that planet with asteroids, I don't remember if he cl- or when he raids Coruscant with asteroids, I mean, I think those are visually cloaked as well, but like when it comes, like when they test out the cloaking on the freighter, for example, um, it doesn't disappear. It just, they lose the signal on it. Um, the freighter doesn't have a visual cloak because they can still see it. Uh, cause they say it doesn't change, but because the whole thing is the freighter is flying in. It's, they think it's a normal freighter. Um, but the interior is hidden, um, yeah. which is where the cloaking comes in. 
I don't think that's right, die, but it, it might be, I guess. He's saying that the it's the mole miners inside the ship that are cloaked, but they talk about how they're putting the, the cloaking on the freighter. Um, yeah, I think it's just like the, the hold has the cloak in it where okay. the mole miners are within that area and they're cloaked while they're there. Hmm. But... Uh, but yeah, so Thrawn's big attempt to get a bunch of capital ships and stuff is broken. So where is he going to... So my big question for you here is with that mm. force of ships out of commission that he's not getting those, where could he possibly get that many new ships? Yeah, like... There needs to be some sort of uh, force of darkness um, that could rise to the challenge um, that he could somehow crew. Um, but I guess we'll have to wait until further yeah. books. Or maybe he'll uh, just use those Star Destroyers he has. Maybe. Uh, mm, maybe. But I think that... I think that's... Uh, that's Heir to the Empire. Yep. I mean, the battle at the end isn't... It's mostly... Uh, it's kind of a traditional... Like X-wing style battle where yeah, it follow mostly the Falcon uh, and the dog fighting and stuff. It's pretty. It's pretty cool though. There's a cool scene where um, Rogue Squadron's like in a battle. Uh, it's very Return Return of the Jedi esque because they talk about like fighting around a cruiser, and then the Falcon flies over. It's a pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool image. Mm -hmm. um, it, it the 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 final battle I quite enjoy though. It's it's good. yeah. It's the uh, the cocky space troopers and stuff. Yeah, and listening in on the. Uh, on the yeah, there's a lot of cool little moments with it, yeah. uh, like the skirmishing throughout uh, the ships that's going on, even when they're cleaning up. It's like, yeah, one <laughs> ended up flying into this thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like they destroyed a Corellian Corvette just to be a dick. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean the, the yeah, I, I also like how Imperials are generally pretty calm. It's like the one thing we didn't mention. I really liked um, when they're on Merker, how the stormtroopers like, even though. They don't really know that it's Luke Skywalker. They still do all of like they launch the perfect like capture maneuver. They pincer the uh, the they they pincer the what's it called like Luke and Mara when they're walking through the woods, and then when they're walking through the city, you know, yeah. they're just very professional. Uh, they you know they come out a realistic way with um, their chariot assault vehicles and their ATST or sorry mm. not their ATST their speeders and stuff. I don't know, it's just pretty cool. Uh, yeah, all the all the battle scenes I think were done uh, pretty well. Like not quite to the intricate detail level of X wing dog fights for space battles. Yeah, uh, not what it's about though. <laughs> yeah, the even Bill Bringy, we only get like a, a broad overview. For yeah, a lot that's of it, got kind but... of like a Return of the Jedi situation. Mm -hmm. Three different things going on, and like, like if you think about like the Battle of Endor, like no one knows mm -hmm. like. You know the kind of grand strokes, so how they blow up the SSD and stuff, but... Uh, and anyway, flies into it with nothing else contributing. <laughs> on that note, I, I did have this in my... Uh, this is something the new canons touched on pretty heavily with the... Did you read the Battlefront book? No. Um, they touched on it in the Battlefront book and Lost Stars especially, how, like, the Empire, like, yeah, they still have lots of, like, personnel, but, like, between the first Death Star, the Executor, and the second Death Star, they've, like, lost all of their best talent. <laughs> It's like, yeah, maybe three million people is not necessarily a death blow to the Empire, but it's like you've lost three million of the best of the best. Yeah. You know, you've lost like the top one percent. Um so Yeah, this is where like all the best people go to get promoted and some of them get yeah. murdered, but still you're the best and brightest are all gone. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. Just the disruptive force that had on the ability of the Empire to yeah, totally. And it's like most of the bridge probably on is like women and children. <laughs> it doesn't say children, but it's it's like young people basically. Mm -hmm. uh, we got several emails if you want to get to that now. Or is there anything else you want to say before we get to those? Uh, No, I guess the other, only other thing, uh, the Empire. I guess people people probably wonder like when they read this then later stories. Where's the Empire? And the Essential Guide to Warfare kind of talks about the fact that Thrawn basically leaves most of the... Because, like, he did kind of unify the Warlords. Um, yeah, like he kind of... Uh, powers, but they... they he get, leaves them, basically. Yeah, some resources directed towards him. Uh, yeah. They stay a lot politically independent for the most part. Mm -hmm. But... 
a lot of that yeah, gets you... beyond the scope of what the Thrawn trilogy actually covers, totally. where they, we don't hear too much about the internal affairs of the Empire. Just the that's a bit of a that's a bit of a retcon to kind yeah. of. Well, we do hear we do hear mention of like the Council or some mm-hmm. Imperial Council. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, like the the Central God of Warfare talks about how Kane almost gave him his uh, superstar destroyer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we get uh, we get some stuff like the planets they're taking. Like you are now under the imperial rule, right? We're back under the rule of imperial law. But all right, so do you want to read questions before we do the ranking? Or uh, yeah, so we're gonna get to the emails first. If anyone has any questions they want us to get to in the chat, uh, leave them in the chat now, and we'll. If you want we to get a lot of email questions though, so yeah. we might not. Yeah. Uh, we got four emails this week. Two like we both read all of them. Uh, we really appreciate them. We might have to skim. Uh, just to the question parts of them rather than reading the whole thing uh, mm-hmm. because we are already three hours deep. But yeah. we really do appreciate the emails. Uh, we and get a keep lot. Keep sending of, them because. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Logan asks, who the heck is Thrawn? I think we covered that. He's uh, yeah. basically a Chiss, like a, a species from the Unknown region. He's a master tactician. He spent much of the Galactic Civil War out uh, in the Unknown regions trying to like pacify and bring imperial culture and rule quasi imperial rule i do like how uh Pallion says a few times how how things would be different if thrawn was commanding at endor because like at the very end i guess that's one thing i wanted to mention Pallion's expecting thrawn because the beginning stages of his plan are messed up he's like well i guess we're just gonna kill ourselves now yeah and in, in battle and thrawn's like no like this is just like shit dude don't worry <laughs> this was just this is just a um uh a first step that we screwed up so hmm uh um, if so for anyone in the in the chat that's putting a question that you want us to answer for the for the podcast if you could just put like question in all caps beforehand yeah. so it's a bit easier to spot in the chat yeah maybe uh but our second question here from will uh what kind of bears best uh polar uh my real question yeah. is which star wars author do you think brings space battles to life the most or which one just makes them play out like a movie in your head i think zon does very well with both capital ships and starfighter combat. So do you have an opinion on that so far? Maybe just limiting it to uh, what we've read uh, thus far. I mean, Stackpole gets the scale right, I think. Um, mm. Actually, I don't know. St- St- Stackpole, I think, does a really good job on like like individual s- fighter stuff. Um, but I think Aaron Alston does better when it comes to capital ship stuff. But... Even though Zahn is was much simpler, he really captured the uh, like it, it, the battle. I think he sets it up in an interesting way, and actually kind of captured for me the feel of like the Battle of Endor at Return of the Jedi the most. So yeah. I'm actually gonna go kind of surprising maybe to some people and say Zahn. Yeah, I think uh, Zahn manages to balance it with uh, with the plot overall better. But I do yeah. think that just for their own sake that. Uh, Stackpole and Austin mm-hmm. do the better space combat. Probably Stackpole, okay. uh, and it worked really well with X Wing, where like that kind of was what the books were, where it's uh, Top Gun. I mean, the the Battle of the Lusankia is really cool. Um, yeah, that's that's like a highlight, I think. Yeah. For me. Uh, so I think I'm gonna go with Stackpole, but mm-hmm. I think there's lots of good space combat up come. there as well. Um. Okay. So. Hold on. Is there, is there anything else in that email? Any other questions? Uh, no. Okay. So uh, there's actually for the next email, there's kind of two that are uh, mm-hmm. from both Neil and Duncan. And we also just got a question from Nathan uh, in the mm-hmm. chat and probably a few others, but that's just what mm-hmm. jumped out at me. Uh, okay. That how Thrawn compares in new canon to this canon. Uh, right. That's the general gist of what all three of them were going for. So if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, I think Thrawn as a character, they pretty much nailed in new canon. Mm-hmm. The stories have been weaker um, just because they've been so limited, I think. But the character, they've done a really good job with. Uh, we still, I mean, he's still out there. I, I have high hopes that we get a really good Thrawn series. I mean, they've invested pretty heavily. And I'm like, I, I never would have believed that we would see Thrawn on a TV show because everyone who knows the expanded universe knows Thrawn. But, you know, I've said this before. 
my friends are hardcore Star Wars fans. I've got huge friends that, you know, they love Star Wars. They'll watch The Mandalorian. They wouldn't even know who Thrawn is. Um, mm-hmm. Just because the EU is such a small portion of Star Wars fans. Yeah. So the fact that they're, you know, there is a lot to say about the fact that Disney did, you know, close the Legends stuff. That's a conversation for another day. But the fact that they're giving such a Legends character among, let's be honest, a minority of people who read Legends, like the spotlight in various ways is pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, Thrawn is being made by the same person who made Thrawn. Yeah. Like it's still those. The new Thrawn books were still made by Zahn. Uh, yeah. I think he's the more... Thrawn we get in Rebels is slightly more in line with the Thrawn trilogy Thrawn because he's still set up mm-hmm. more as villain McBad guy. But because that show is more directed towards younger audiences, uh, mm-hmm. he's not like complete caricature bad guy. But we do yeah. get more of the uh, version of Thrawn that would have killed Peterson than we get in like Outbound yes. Flight, which lines up better with what uh, Zahn is doing in the new Thrawn trilogy. And mm-hmm. as I've already said, I do think that like... The version of Thrawn I like the most is the Outbound Flight version of Thrawn, Definitely. which lines up most with what we get in uh, in the new trilogy, new even game. though I do yeah. agree that uh, the overall plot of the, uh, of the new Thrawn trilogy kind of falls flat because uh, like we know where it's going. They don't yeah. have much freedom to go. Uh, like it's all already established. It's set in a place Nothing that's already really established. Changes, yeah. We know he's going to end up in a big whale mouth, uh, and he's probably going to come <laughs> out of that. But that's yeah. why I'm really looking forward, actually, to the Ascendancy trilogy. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not sure when that's going to be set, but if it's set slightly after, at a point where we know it can diverge more, or we we're not 100 percent sure. Well, where some of it's going to, end going up. to be a prequel, at least. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's kind of my take on that. My hope is like. Honestly, my my hope is after we get episode nine out of the way, I hope that they I think there's two options. Either I think that there's a chance that episode nine is treated like the war to end all wars. And after that, the the universe is just done. I I think that that's a possibility. And like they they focus mostly on the past. Otherwise, I don't see why you can't bring Thrawn back to be a new villain or to be a new like give him room to work with in a new time period. Kind of just like the same thing that happened with Legends. But like, okay, think, he was in a space whale, but he could be who knows yeah. where. Well, Dave Filoni's even said, like, we explicit, we didn't explicitly kill him off because we want oh, them yeah. to be free to, to He's use 100%. them. We needed to resolve his plot for the show, but mm-hmm. also, like, they're very much planning for yeah. Zahn specifically to bring him back. Like, I would be the shocked only, if that didn't happen. The only tough part is, I wish they left more. I honestly wish they would have left the New Republic era before more episode open. seven. I, I wish they would have not covered it as much because they've kind of yeah. basically outlined the fact that not there wasn't a lot of conflict during yeah. it. Yeah. So um, if we see anything in that period, it would have to be uh, anything he's doing in the unknown regions that isn't controlled by the First Order. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I I think they've been pretty clear on like the point of the uh, sequel trilogy being about resolving the Skywalker storyline. And yeah. I do think a lot of what they've done best uh in like the stuff that i've enjoyed most is the stuff that uh isn't part of the mainline series uh Mm -hmm. so like i really like rogue one i really like what they're doing with the mandalorian so i can see them still being fine with there being other major wars it's just wars that aren't about the skywalkers it's just Uh, i kind of feel like they're going for something like i don't know like the whole to me the whole like ray and kylo ren thing i think they're clearly supposed to be like I don't know, like some sort of like avatars, kind of like Anakin was in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like, I just feel like they might be going for like, I don't know, like a a yin and a yang thing. And when they finally, this is like coming into some Raylo shit, probably. I like, I'm not a uh, like an into that, but it's just like I think there's themes that they might decide to go with that would, um, you know, kind of see. I don't know because like the, the the prophecy or what whatever the the grand thing in the Star Wars series is like whether the prophecy is fulfilled and there's balance or or whatever else yeah I, I feel that's a they might be going and yeah. then they might decide that okay well like all these things have happened and maybe maybe there is no more conflict like maybe there is actually finally peace or whatever but yeah, yeah. this is probably more of a discussion for uh like a post yes last uh the last sky rise, yeah. rise of the last skywalker jedi yeah. return of the sith 
yeah phantom <laughs> menace clone attack of the jedi the rise of the phantom strikes jedi. back uh but yeah oh, you almost did all of them rogue one solo <laughs> uh but yeah so i think that more or less covers our opinion on yeah uh how thrawn compares and then so much more yeah uh I kind of covered his next question about over the top we covered that um i think right? yeah uh colton calculated what he said reading and art was a bit over the top and, and i've already kind of gone yeah. on enough rants for one podcast about that yeah yeah but uh but yeah so he he also agrees mark thompson is the best audiobook commentator or reader he's phenomenal hmm. um okay duncan uh, uh do you... duncan asked yeah. about the same front thing but if you want to um let's see yeah i mean he's kind I, of asking about the same uh the disney novels things and that's probably a, a something we'll get into when we'll, when we get to some of those novels yeah maybe a bit of a long discussion to get into three and yeah three hours um, deep into this podcast I, th- I think i think we covered most of it yeah um yeah yeah so thanks for the emails guys uh if you want to send an email for uh, the next episode, asking any questions about Dark Force Rising or giving thoughts on this podcast, mm-hmm. uh, that's tapcalf transmissions at gmail dot com. I think there'll be in the description. Calf for without that. an e. Yeah, tapcalf without. It's on the screen or yeah. on your podcast reader. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know who asked this. The moving city on Nick Lawn, I, th- I think, is pretty cool. Um, yeah. I watched your video, and yeah, I was disappointed because it's basically described as like a dreadnought on a bunch of AT ATs. Basically stays in like the shadow of the moon, so or like not the shadow of the moon. It stays, stays on the dark side of the planet, basically, so they don't get roasted. That and the uh, the shield ships are pretty cool. Yeah, uh, the, the comic just makes it look like it's a weird giant steam yeah. ship. Yeah, the, the, it's the, not the art for there. the first uh, book, the comic is really bad. It gets a little better. Yeah, and it's amazing because there's so many. Well, I guess at that no, it, it came out at a point where there'd be enough dreadnought fan art that they could have traced for. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Uh, Certainly. <laughs> but was Thrawn a Sherlock Holmes? And uh, Nathan asks also was Thrawn a Sherlock Holmes analog like he's in the new trilogy? Uh, could you see him joining or align with the New Republic post Endor? Uh, not this version. Yeah, not the Thrawn trilogy version, but the version that we're retconned into with air with. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pr- probably would have had he been yeah. reborn. The like one thing I did, yeah. Empire of the Hand was basically gearing up for that, and they did cooperate with the New Republic. So yeah. if we take what Park did as kind of a stand-in for Thrawn, uh, mm-hmm. then Which I think it's kind of that interesting because even though Mara and Luke know that, they're like, don't try to save him, or I guess they don't try to kill him either. Like Luke's like kind of belated. Well, he's like kind of happy when Thrawn dies, and I'm like. Are you serious? Like he would have been probably your greatest ally, but yeah, I could. Well, just the the threat of Thrawn was throwing things into such disarray. Yeah, that even if Thrawn was like, yeah, I'm cool with you guys now, then Thrawn's there'd still be enough people in the New Republic just being like, no. Thrawn's got a mega. No, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna self censor. Uh. What do you think is the best first way to learn about Thrawn for newbies? Uh, listen uh, to this and the yeah, next two episodes of Tab Calf Transmissions. Yeah. Yep. You'll hear everything Don't you need read to the know. books. Or play Thrawn's Revenge. Um, yep. I think that's it. Uh, Thrawn does say he's working on an assumption that the departure logs from Nomad City computers were accurate when they said Lando was one of the Han and Leia on the other. Uh, I mean, that isn't really the part that I had issues with, but I kind of spent 15 minutes on that already so i won't subject anyone else to my complaint for that uh astra um, asked a question which she thinks isn't relevant but it actually is um how did luke ever train anyone when he never finished his own that's like basically his ultimate issue here like he doesn't feel qualified like he's like oh, i wish i could ask somebody this question uh like like leia asks him like is this maybe harder for me because i have some training already and it's hard for me to break that Looks like probably, but I don't know, and I wish I had somebody to ask. We will look into that, and we will get back to you. <laughs> yeah, let me just check Coruscant real quick. Uh, and any other questions we missed? I guess we'll do the book rankings now, and then if we've missed yeah. anything, uh, you want to go first? Okay, so 
my rankings as they stand so far, and I, I really next episode I already have I'm a way to do this. the. Okay. No, <laughs> next episode I have a way to visually represent it, so we don't have to read the entire list every time. But so you far, that, we've got the technology available to us. Uh, I do when I'm streaming it because I have the my video thing, but I can mm. just also send you the. I, I got it. I can that. Yeah. But uh, this was some too many other preparations to have it done for this week. But either way. It, okay. It's really, I'm talking about it like it's some weird technology. It's literally just a... Plagueis, Medstar, Iron Fist, <laughs> Yeah, Plagueis, Medstar 1, Iron Fist, Wraith Squadron, Medstar, Jedi Healer, uh, Back to War, Rogue Squadron, Solo Command, Wedges Gamble, Courtship of Princess Leia, Truce of Akura, Kratos Trap. Uh, I am putting Heir to the Empire at number two. I think it's still okay. edged out by Plagueis, but I think it is slightly better than Medstar 1. Yeah, I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, for me, it's... I'll just say my final ranking. It's a Plagueis, Heir to the Empire, Rogue Squadron, Battle Surgeons, Back to War, Wedge's Gamble, Med Star, Jedi Healer, Iron Fist, Courtship, Wraith, Solo, Bakura, Krytos. Yeah, so Krytos is going to stay at the bottom for a while. Uh... Yeah, for a long time. <laughs> like the other ones, like some of the other ones are so campy that like even that alone will probably like when we get to Anti-Force and uh, and um uh crystal star i'd be like this book's shit but they just swam in a giant goo monster and they're talking about the (laughs) anti-force it's more interesting than anything that happens in kratos (laughs) uh and i guess we've got that last question there do you want to from primary yeah we can quickly discuss that and then Uh, i think that'll um... be it I think, I don't know, like, I don't like the idea of clones being, like, capable of, like, harnessing the Force, at least not regularly. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, we don't, I don't really know enough about, I can't, I can't decide. Do you have, the question is for podcast listeners, um, do you prefer Clone Wars as they are presented before the prequels or what we actually got? I I kind of like what we actually got, like, the the whole Clone Masters where all the clones just went mad uh yeah i I, I think it depends more on execution i'm i'm sure there there's a world where i enjoy that but yes uh i enjoyed what we got so i'm fine with saying i prefer that for now yep me too Uh, what is the point of airborne clone troopers when there's jetpack troopers i mean it's the same thing they're just named something different well the ones here are like fully meant for like zero g and and vacuum combat they've got like a really thick suit and like they can probably take like a couple of, like like they're not going to get sizzled by a turbo laser well maybe a turbo laser but they're not going to get sizzled by a laser just missing them you know what I mean yeah but uh I think that that does yeah, it that's it so right, that guys. that was three oh. hours and fifteen minutes uh originally we were going to do some other streaming after this is yeah it might be too late probably going to hold off on that yeah uh, so thanks for watching everyone. Have a great day, night, week, whatever. May the force be with you. Goodbye. We'll be back with Dark Force Rising in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Oh, yeah. We should probably mention that. on Yeah. Uh, The podcast isn't ending after this episode. Uh, We should be back (laughs) December 5th. Are you? Um, I will let you know. Okay. So we are (laughs) tentatively scheduled for December 5th. We will uh, announce when we know for sure. Uh, But that'll be on Datapad, my channel. Uh, and we'll be talking about Katana Fleets. Yes. Good night, everyone. Good night.